Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to our June meeting and um, start with our opening prayer. I can give thanks for the contribution by pioneers, early settlers, and those who fought in the various wars for the fabric of Tetherville community we have today. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be accepted in my sight and the Lord. Amen. Acknowledgement of country, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that we're meeting on here today. I'd also like to pay respect to those who by the past and present, the Yapaw, Kamilaroi, and Bunjalung nations, and extend that respect to the other, other Aboriginal people present. Councillors, apologies for doing it. Apologies from Councillor Don Forbes and Councillor Bob Rowe. Can I have a word and second to accept your apologies? Thanks. Councillor Brett Sawyer, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Mike Petrie, thank you. All in favour? Ken, Karen. Councillor Disclosures of uh, interest and declarations, please. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, I'm declaring a non pecuniary interest in item COM 7 slash 18, donation from the care centre. I am the chairman of the board. No financial inducement to return to leave for that position. Councillor, you, you're indicating you'll be staying in the room? I will be staying in the room. We've followed with the confirmation of the previous minute from someone that was in attendance at the. I'm sorry. Oh, I apologise. We have moved and seconded for the declaration from Councillor Sawyer. Councillor Robin Petrie, thank you. Second by Councillor Gary Berry, and I thank you. All in favour? Against the okay. Confirmation for the previous minutes from our, our uh, minutes of our <coughs> last meeting in May, councillors. Someone who was in attendance at that meeting might like to move that they are true in the second record, please. Councillor Brian Murray, thank you. Second by please. Councillor Robin Petrie, and I thank you. All in favour? Against the okay. Thank you. Councillors, we move on to taping the documents. No taping the documents, urgent, late, and supplementary items of business. We welcome councillors to our community consultation public access session. And we fully support him of uh, our CE and the wonderful job he's doing with the um, NSR with our monthly operational report. We have um, two speakers, Mr. Barry Few, Acting Manager of HR and Workforce Development. Mr. Barry, would you like to come forward, please, and councillors? Barry, the staff member, please stand and welcome Barry to our chamber. Thank you, councillors. Welcome, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of being able to talk to you this morning uh, about uh, human resources and workforce development. Uh, I think we've got a slide that's due to come up at uh, any moment. Could you use the mic, please? Thank this you. This way. <laughs> okay. Right, well, this is our subject matter of today, and uh, we'll move on through through the, uh, the presentation. What I've done this morning is that uh, the University of Technology Sydney, that's UTS, has done some very interesting research work on the resources that are available to local government and various trends in, uh, in the workforce. I have had a long-term belief that there are only three things that are important in local government, in <coughs> government, and in, in fact, general employment. And those three things are people, money or finance, and technology. Now, if I was talking to an engineer, he'd probably say, add engineering to that, but technology embraces the use of certainly engineering skills, but also all the assets and IT that are used in an industry to produce a result. The other two items, people and finance, you can't go anywhere without them. So I'm talking today about that first one, the people side of things. So a lot of work has been done in that area in terms of national uh, profiling of uh, workforce strategy. There are three items that they highlight as being critical in this particular area. The first one, attraction, retention, and development. These are the challenges faced by anybody that's involved in, uh, in HR work. And that's the, the same challenge that presents itself to the Shire in terms of attracting, retaining, and developing the right people. Now, I would make some comment about retaining at this particular point in time. 
in industry there is a, a, a need sometimes to turn over your workforce. So retention whilst uh, very valuable at certain levels also can be a, a, a drawback in that you're not refreshing your workforce peri periodically. Here in Tenerfield we have a, a situation where you have a very stable workforce uh, at the technical or operational levels but most of the turnover is achieved at the more senior levels and that's a tradition that's taking place throughout, throughout industry. A couple of years ago the turnover in, uh, in senior levels of chief executives they generally lasted about two years in an organisation and then moved on. That figure has changed now for about four or five years before they move on and perhaps that's well reflected in contract. Some people stay for life, some people have golden handcuffs put on them, some people move on fairly regularly to expand their experience. So uh, retention is important at various levels because you have investments in people as you go and then of course development to keep and refresh your workforce. The next one talks about the key issues in workforce uh, strategy that you always need to, to look at and that is the issue of um, the development of people, the collection of data and the continual uh, um, process of developing your workforce to meet what you need. Uh, we do all of those issues, we, we uh, plan a, a strategy, a workforce strategy, uh, we collect data, this in, in the parlance of people involved in HR is called HR metrics, uh, so we collect the data and that data includes comparisons with the remuneration that we supply as opposed to other local government bodies. There's a very extensive amount of research done on that. We collect data on age, gender and various other attributes. Certainly the baseline of that is skills and how the people, hit, whether or not the people have the skills that are, need to be applied in the organisations. Uh, these particular items, these uh, um, eight items are the issues that you need to consider when you are going through a workforce strategy and you'll be familiar with all of these in particular where you need to uh, certainly have um, consideration of all these key factors. I'm not going to dwell on them too much but uh, these are the, the parts of strategy that we need to consider when we develop the strategy. In terms of the findings of this research there were issues that needed to be considered and they're very current issues which uh, you will be uh, again quite familiar with particularly in the area of uh, uh, the employment to, in terms of equity and diversity the uh, public sector employment targets really um, related to the employment of indigenous folk and the setting of targets there uh, you will also be familiar with the the need to increase the balance between female managers and counsellors. I'm quite interested in the mix that's in the room here at the moment. But out in the private sector, there is a great deal of pressure there. there. And uh, it's quite important that we look at that balance. It's interesting, and I have a slide a little bit later on the balance that we have. We need to obviously consider ageing. The 5% down at the bottom there doesn't really relate to the, 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 uh, the number within uh, place-based employment, it says that we, we need to look at the percentage of place-based employment that we provide. Now you say, what's place-based mean? That means the local geographical area. And I know that there is a need to provide opportunities for people who, who live here to work here. And uh, that's uh, a major consideration in workforce strategy. So those are the issues. Spade Hill uh, refers to the, the fact that workforces are divided amongst the, uh, the, the sectors of government as well as the private sector and there is a balance that's required there. How the sector is shaping? This uh, is slightly uh, complex. They're basically involved with the ABS statistics about the number of employees that are involved in in local government and uh, we've seen there that there is a growing difference in the, the more recent uh, place of work statistics in that there is a reduction of the number of people that actually work in local government who live at the location where local government is and so there is a reduction and there's a tendency to have to draw in 
spill throughout some of the area. And this is right across local government. You'll see here, however, that there is a, a change in size of the workforce. Local government is increasing, not a huge increase, but increasing in the number of people that he employs across Australia. Uh, this also talks about the average council size in that it's looking now that there is a growth in the and the one that will have been of first interest to you is in the rural sector uh, because um, Tenerfield is, is classified as a medium rural council and it's verging on now being known as a rural large council in terms of its comparison with the industry but you'll notice that the size of council uh, on this right hand column reflects fairly closely the employment at Tenderfield with the, the 92 in 2016 up from 80 in 2011 which uh, which again is an average figure. Again this one here is place based employment and as I mentioned before the, the number of people or the percentages of people in place based employment in other words taken from the geographic area is reducing. So another one that interests a lot of people in terms of the ageing workforce. Uh, it's interesting here that, uh, of course, provision is made for it, uh, older workers and the, the diminishing number at that level. But interestingly, if you follow the curve, uh, it looks at school entry and trainees, which we do have some experience in, that it grows to a, a, a bend in the elbow where it refers particularly to the, the time at which people obtain their commute their qualification or complete a trade, then it peaks out in the middle middle years and starts to decline. This grouping here would be those who consider early retirement and these people who are deciding to work on and naturally it diminishes it as it goes. Uh, this one also refers to the education in the sector. Uh, you'll find here that exactly as needed uh, across on the column here uh, there is a demand within local government for certificate three and four qualifications, particularly in the outdoor staff. And then you come across to the next highest grouping, which is the degree-based qualifications, which reflects a lot of the engineering, both environmental and civil, as well as other, as other qualifications that are needed in local government. This, of course, talks about the top 25 occupations in local government, reflecting, of course, the number of people that uh, they work in trades, but it also reflects that in a lot of other councils, particular urban ones, there is a, a concentration on things like aged care, community services, rather than on roads and maintenance, which are issues more for a rural council. Uh, this one here refers to Indigenous employment. Across the nation, um, local government is, a, is probably the highest achiever in Indigenous employment. But again, uh, it's, it's a continuing challenge that faces uh, all local government areas. This one, which uh, is uh, again a lot of figures, but it shows, of course, that there, there is retention within local government. The next slide is a bit easier to follow, in that it, the figures that EGS produced says that the rate of retention within local government is not greatly different to the private sector or the federal government. Uh, with a 69% retention rate. I'd have to say that below a certain level within this organisation, the re retention rate is getting much closer to 100%, whereas at the more senior levels, it's a bit higher, uh, higher than that, or lower than that as ever. Now I just want to talk about the issues that are in the monthly operational report, uh, the workforce health and safety. Uh, in that area, one of the biggest demands in workplace health and sa safety is the area of providing training. And uh, I've highlighted the, the courses that have taken place in the last year. And you'll find there that there will, a lot of those are safety basis uh, based. There is a very deep concentration on, uh, on the outdoor workforce in all of those. You will notice uh, overhead wires is mentioned there, traffic control a very high risk occupation, as you probably will know. But this is, this is what's been supplied in terms of training in this past year for um, the outdoor staff. And some of them, of course, uh, relate to, to indoor staff as well. Um, in terms of wellness activity, 
uh, council does pursue that quite strongly and you'll find that we had uh, black dog for those of you who are familiar of course that's associated with mental health awareness we had uh, before the end of uh, this uh, last calendar year uh, towards November December we arranged for a, an all staff meeting on uh, mental health issues so we've used black uh, dog but again on a more practical side there are, there are vaccinations that we supply across the staff and so we can, we're concerned in terms of wellness and maintaining wellness through health programs. We have quiet programs, we have a, an EAP which is an assistant plan which employees can access if they're having particular home problems or health problems there they can talk confidentially elsewhere. So there is wellness activity. Um, in terms of these slides which I won't dwell on too much but you'll see that, generally speaking, uh, our, uh, our incidents here in this council reflect very well on the on our safety experience. And that the, the green columns throughout these tend to show you Tenderfield's performance against other other areas in terms of our incidents, in terms of comparison there. Um, this just gives you a bit of an idea about incident types. Uh, some of them are property damage, some of them are uh, people damage, and you'll see the, the listed here as to the areas that they cover, cover in terms of the, the incident happening. And the next one, as you might expect, shows the difference between indoor and outdoor staff, white collar and blue collar staff, where you would expect, of course, uh, incidents to be uh, uh, higher in the, the outdoor staff. But very fortunately, very few of them are, are serious incidents. Uh, in the last year, we had an innovation fund which was used in the last two years um, just to, to uh, make sure that we don't get the, too much of a shock out of this. The, um, the rate there of 140 was the grant. It was uh, 18 months to two years to expend. Council's contribution was over a two year training period with a total part of that program. And if you look through there, in those, uh, there are a couple where all staff, that was the 107, which covers casuals, as well as employment, which covered all the staff there. And then there's 201 training places throughout the rest of those courses. And a lot of those were occupied by uh, outdoor staff. Uh, in terms of the voice project and other communication, I've listed there some of the means of communication, there's post-council briefings, uh, toolbox meetings and a range of other communication that takes place. And on top of that we've recently, as you would be aware, uh, completed a voice survey from all staff which has gained some very valuable feedback on actions that we should take as a council to, uh, to improve our workplace relations. Uh, the monthly operational report has a number of things that uh, you will have viewed, reviewed as far as HR and workforce development are concerned and you'll find that those are the, the range of them. It indicates the number that are green uh, and those where there is uh, continuing work being done. Uh, these are just a listing of the various uh, requirements within the uh, uh, monthly operational report and it talks about some of the progress that we have made there in terms of the importance of reward systems. Uh, we do regular comparisons with the remuneration that we pay as opposed to other councils and we are able to measure whether we're on the median or above or below that and it's done identifying us with similarly staffed councils, similar populations, similar areas. So we look at that, that's uh, constantly looked at, and uh, there are a whole range of issues to be considered in that. When you compare remuneration programs, you need to take into account the total package. And most of it's done on a total remuneration package basis uh, in order to compare it, and obviously that includes the use of motor vehicles as well as other benefits like superannuation and of course cash. The other ones that here where we've been making some progress are the areas of mentoring. That's something that is done very quietly when people it's discovered that people are best trained through mentoring from another. Uh, with paperless office, which is another challenge that we've, 
we've got, we're working on a digitisation project to reduce the number of paper, the amount of paper that's stored, for instance, in this building. Uh, that's part of um, uh, coming up with a paperless office and the, the use of technology uh, and uh, improvement in record keeping. Uh, strategies, these are the implementation of the plan. We're using comparison with HR metrics, it's an ongoing requirement. Again, with the uh, salary system, we've been review, reviewing that. Uh, we are updating the one that we used. It's uh, provided by a group called ECOP, and it takes into account all the skills and capacities that people have to devote to a job uh, through a questionnaire basis, and comes up with a result and indicates to us the rate of salary that should apply. Uh, performance system, we have a performance management system which we are updating to make sure that it keeps uh, abreast with developments in the area. They're always controversial. A lot of organisations like them because they're not attached to money. Maybe as you'll find another, uh, a lot of other organisations like performance appraisal where it's attached to money. So it's a no-win situation of often in that organisation design. Of course, you have seen the, the structure as Council approved it and recently published and being kept up to date. And training, the importance of keeping that going. Uh, and of course, our outdoor spend is very significant in the area of training. We currently have 15 of our existing employees on an apprenticeship training program to achieve a certificate three. And in future, we're insisting that anybody that uh, takes on a job as an outdoor plant operator, they have a certificate three where they're willing to undertake the program that we provide. So we get funds from the state government in doing that. So those are other issues. And then the other issues that we're involved in, one of the important ones here is succession. And that's been recently looking at whether if we lost a particular staff member, how we would cover that job. And we've been doing that. One of the most practical examples I could give you is in the records management area where we didn't have an automatic replacement in that area, but we now have somebody who's been training up to, to do that particular role. So succession is very important to this council, particularly when it's sometimes hard to attract particular, particular skills. The other very good thing that we found in the, uh, the HR field in terms of jobs that we've advertised to be filled, we're finding a very, um, very good quality of applicants. Some of them pe are local people, some of them are people who have returned to Tenderfield after a time away. Uh, we found that uh, there are partners who are coming into town who have got particular skills that they can use to the benefit of council. So that's a, a very encouraging thing with the quality of our applications. We do have some difficulty in some areas there. Uh, probably the most difficult job to fill uh, is in the health and building area. Um, principally because there's a shortage of health and building people. And we uh, are currently looking at uh, a training your own program. Uh, we've made an offer particularly to an internal employee who has a building ticket to, uh, to undertake training in that area because it is very difficult to obtain and refresh in that area. That's principally the most difficult area to, to fill. Emergency management, uh, that too is in our uh, monthly operational report. The key, uh, key issues that I wanted to ra raise there is that we've made a strategic shift of the um, emergency management operations so that it frees the engineering staff to be available to undertake emergency duty when that should happen. And uh, we're handling the coordination side of things from the workplace health and safety and workforce development area. Now one of the urgent things to uh, uh, attack there is a simulation plan that allows us to uh, simulate a, a particular emergency event and how we handle that. Uh, these are just some local uh, figures here. You'll notice this, these are Tenderfell Shire Council's gender demographics and you'll, you'll see that we have a higher number of males to females but it's catching up here. Uh, this past week we've offered uh, the first job to the first female plant operator that we've had and we've had female staff in parks and gardens but the, the number is, is starting to match up and this is our age demographics where you'll see it's pretty well balanced between the 
the over in the middle of where things had, of course, the the the, the, the sixty plus area is 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 diminishing as one would expect. Um, these are just some items that I've included here, where it's important for us to look at uh, the issue with engagement, making sure that our salaries and our benefits keep pace sufficiently to attract people, but very conscious of the cost to council, uh, then that you can't afford to splash money around in, in, in retaining people, but you need to be competitive in that area. I just uh, threw these particular slides in, uh, rather than hand drawing it. This is a, uh, a traditional situation in that the public sector for the lower grades right throughout tends to pay more than the private sector. If you work in local government, you can in fact be paid more than you would in a private sector job. But as the, more, the rate, the role becomes more senior, uh, it certainly becomes less than the private sector. Uh, this next slide uh, illustrates the same case in terms of uh, the slide edge. Uh, certainly as you get higher up the scale, the edge that comes towards the, the private sector over the public sector. But if you look at recent studies, you'll find that uh, there has been a growth in uh, government uh, <coughs> paying over and above that of the private sector. Well, that just about takes me out uh, for a presentation on that. Hopefully I've covered items that will be of interest to you. Thank you for your time. Barry, thank you very much for the presentation and, and uh, I uh, thank you for the outstanding job you've been doing as our HR manager and workforce development. I'm sure Council is very appreciative of the information we've been shared with this morning and uh, Council is pleased to be back Barry will state we do have a need to keep moving. We have another presentation plus a citizenship later. Another two, I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll ask Barry and he can to take the smoke over and have any questions there. So Barry, is that okay with you? Yes. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry, Council, we need to keep going. Uh, next um, presentation is actually Lee Bluting, Mr. Brad Fine. Brad, if you'd like to come forward. Council, once again, please stand and welcome Brad to our chamber. Thank you, Councillors. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Councillors, Senior Officer of Council. I feel very privileged this morning to be able to present you this morning. Um, both uh, a very brief background on what my role here is at council and uh, deliver my operation report section. Um, I first would like to, uh, to those who don't know me, my, my name is Brad Fahan. Um, I'm currently council's acting police coordinator, as I just pointed out. Uh, the key aspects of my role, uh, the overseeing the day to day running of the council in support of general operations, uh, the operation of the mechanical workshop delivery of the preventive maintenance program, mechanical fabrication and technical support to other departments, to monitor and maintain fleet efficiency, flexibility in the support of council objectives and community expectation, delivery of the plant replacement program, and the delivery of the long-term fleet asset management plan. Largely, council fleet department operates behind the scenes and could be viewed as an internal hire company of vehicles, plant and allowance uh, of equipment to other departments within council. Uh, the primary aim of the fleet is to be cost neutral or effectively pay its own way, meaning the staffing, operation and capital fleet costs are offset by the perceived income uh, through internal hire. Um, this requires the fleet to be well structured, uh, fit for purpose, efficient and cost effective. As a benchmark, the fleet hire rates must remain competitive with external hire markets and third party offerings. Um, the fleet itself uh, consists of 35 light vehicles, 19 trucks, 19 major earth moving, or yellow fleet sometimes referred to, and 51 specialised plant equipment items. They're all the larger aspects of, of the fleet, um, and there's approximately 130 small plant and equipment items, um, including things like chainsaws and bigger snippers. Um, the overall uh, fleet asset as a whole is worth uh, 12.76 million dollars. Um, of interest in the last financial year, Council's light vehicles 
average a combined travel distance per day of 2,063 kilometres. So that's a bit of an idea of, of the nature of council operations, our geographic area, and, and how much we actually do use our light vehicles. Um, the rest of the fleet demonstrated a combined utilisation of 174 hours per day. So um, all of our larger trucks, uh, yellow fleet and such, is all um, recorded as, a, as an hour utilisation rather than kilometre based. So onto the report itself. The fleet plan, uh, plan equipment section of the report is in area 15 and starts on page 84, 85, sorry, of your hard copies. Um, there's a few areas of, of interest there. Um, subsections 1, 4 and 7 of the four year delivery plan section are actually shared with the works uh, manager, uh, which include areas of the stores and depots. So, um, much of these areas are still transitioning um, through the change of structure that we've had fairly recently. So um, both James, the works manager, and I are still working closely together as far as um, identifying certain asset classes and who's responsible they lie in. So um, things of that nature, are things like inspection and, and such as uh, fire extinguishers, lifting chains, um, so electrical test and tags, that, that, that sort of nature. So it sort of falls nearly in the gap between the pair of us and we're working together to, uh, to make sure all those things are covered off. Um, all right, the other areas of note in the, uh, in the thing that we, we lost, uh, unfortunately lost another staff member recently, um, which has impacted our ability to uh, fulfill some of our targets. Um, one of the positive things is, even though we've got very few staff on the ground at the moment, um, we have been able to consistently keep up with our preventive maintenance program, which is an extremely important part um, of fleet operations. Um, if we don't maintain things, um, we'll have obvious reliability issues, extended lengths of downtime, uh, cost of premature wear, um, and possible major component failures along with the obvious safety and operational impact. So that's been the key area that we've, we've tasked what resources we do have um, to that particular area. The downside of that is uh, a strong focus in maintenance and repairs has been the fact that uh, we haven't got the resources to uh, address um, our Planned replacement program, so it's just sort of falling on the wayside, which you, which you can see from further in my report there. Um, we've had several um, items of plant that we've done, <coughs> unfortunately, in the next financial year. Um, simply, we just haven't had the time to prepare the documents and do all the hard work in the background to, to make that happen. So, it, there's, it's a little risk to council that that, that occurs, however. Um, you will have long-term phasing problems with finances if, if we were to, to bundle all of our replacements in one in one pile. So effectively, if you look at like a tyre, it's, it's 10 years round, we'll effectively have a big bulge in the middle of somewhere and as, as that 10 years rolls over, we'll have obviously obvious financial implications and, and have to deal with that bulge each time it comes around. So um, it's, it's better practice obviously to, to have your renewals fairly linear so that so that it hasn't got such an expectation. Um, there's another area that unfortunately we're not able to, to cover on there, which is UI at the moment, um, which is uh, routine inspection. Uh, routine inspections are, are carried out for, for numerous different reasons. Um, we, large, to a large extent, uh, cover off on most of those with our preventative maintenance because uh, Obviously, if you get the machine in there to, to do a maintenance task on, um, you get an opportunity to, to do an, an inspection of that. Um, we have a process in council that we like to see within every three months. Unfortunately, um, with some of the units, we don't get to see that. Uh, it's also a very difficult task to, to outsource, uh, simply because there's, um, there's very little tangible or physical evidence of what's actually been done if you to give a vehicle to a third party to have an inspection that actually know the extent of what's how much they've, they've been interested in actually achieving the task. So um, so that's another area for improvement you know, once we have some resources. Uh, financials and budget. Um, it's quite an attractive uh, position the fleet is in at the moment. 
Um, the fleet capital renewals, unfortunately, as I spoke to, to earlier, um, we're a little bit behind the ball there simply because we haven't purchased all the things we need to this year. And that will clearly extend in the next year, which will require some, some funding shift from this focus in the next. Um, the, there was a, there's a list in the, uh, the actual operational report of the exact items that missed out this year, um, all of which are still, uh, apart from the water car, obviously, you know, at the top there, are all able to still deliver to council at, at expected uh, utilisation. So, um, again, not a great deal of risk to council, but definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, we've got uh, our current utilisation is on track. Um, as you can see in the figures there, this, uh, we're actually nearly 2% above uh, what we had projected to have at this late stage of the year, which is great. Um, it means that uh, we've got uh, our items of play basically been available there. There's had been no extended um, downtime or any of that sort of thing. Um, and they're in line with what council's needs are for operations, so that's, that's a good project. Thing. Equally, we're enjoying a significant reduction in operation costs at the moment. It's almost 14 percent below what we normally expect at this time of year. Um, this is both an indicator of the fact that we are a little bit light on staff, so there's wages of that staff obviously not being a, a burden to the operational plan. But it's also a, a pretty good indicator of, of our fleet's health um, because we're not forced to engage third parties to, to conduct uh, repairs and all those sorts of things. So we are very fortunate to have the fleet in the condition it currently is in. Um, further on uh, to emerging issues within the report there, we, we suffered a minor setback with um, council plate trail recently. Um, there was uh, the fitment of a plate that wasn't actually in the design brief of the trail, was fitted during a wheel liner and such that it actually failed and let the suspension come away from underneath the trail. Uh, that's been very quickly sorted out you know, with, with the supplier under, under obviously full warranty. Um, and now back in full operation. So that trial actually went to the team for instance, yesterday to deliver a piece of plan that's back in full function. However, we look to um, engage a third party mechanical engineer to have a good look at the trial. Um, the trial has been recently purchased and we have concerns, but obviously, the more the quality control measures that this was missing. First instance, so, so that'll be something we can have in quite soon as well. Um, customers, as I spoke to earlier, um, most of our customers are obviously in town, um, with some, and at the moment, there's, as, as you can see in the report, there's been some, uh, some industrial bins that are actually being refurbished. We're doing them totally in house. Um, we've obviously had to buy the materials in, but we've um, used our own labour and, and facilities within council to, to actually facilitate the repair of those bins. Um, well, we transported over to a transfer station this Friday, uh, after being fully painted, and five of them returned. They were refurbished in time for the free week of waste um, deliveries that is coming up in the not too distant future. Um, so basically, starting at the end of the report, um, we have an, an achievement as such that um, we had a work experience uh, student for the week and with us up there. We are very fortunate to um, to have that uh, little bin project and things happening up there, so we've got quite a few experience in, uh, in fabrication of metals and, uh, and using of equipment up there as well. So uh, it's the second time this particular student's been with, uh, with council, so he's obviously very eager and, and quite happy with, with uh, the experiences he's proposed to in the council. Uh, that concludes my brief this morning. I have to take any questions on the report. Thank you, Brad, and, and uh, for the report. And, and uh, I congratulate you on the staff for all the work that you are doing out there. Um, once again, to improve the sort of the, uh, the opportunity that you give to a first councillor here this, here this morning, I think that's a big one. And uh, you've done very well, and I thank you. Councillors, once again, please, we need to keep moving. And uh, Brad, I, I know you're a busy man, but you're more than welcome to stay for some swans and, and a cup of tea. And, uh, and councillors, if you have any questions, want to be on Brad, I'm sure that that will be appropriate that that happens through these invitations. There, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, we'll move on to our uh, to our next guest this morning.
uh, Mr. Peter Murphy needs to speak to report from the Committee of Parks and Gardens and Open Spaces. I hope you all got the transcript what Peter's going to speak to, and, uh, and please stand and welcome Peter to the okay. Thank you, Councillor. Welcome, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, every year over 3 million international tourists travel the globe searching for a new bird watching experience. In the process, they create an industry worth over $15 billion annually. With our beautiful Shire, which is blessed with over 300 Australian native bird species, that's over 40% of all such Australian species. Wait, I apologise. Have you got your mic on? And, and with respect, you score a recording on AV, right? Is it on? It's on now. Okay. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Do you want me to start again? No, continue. With our beautiful Shire, which is blessed with over 300 Australian native bird species, which is over 40% of all such Australian species, were to capture just one fifth of one percent, that's one five hundredth of this international market, we would have an industry worth over thirty million dollars annually, which would create many fallen part-time jobs right across the Shire. The newly created tentacle-based birdwatching institute, of which I am the executive director, is facilitating and supporting the uh, conservation and rehabilitation of our native birds, habitats and species, and the development and promotion of our birdwatching tourism industry through the development and implementation of research, education and training programs. In this regard, the Institute is proud to support the rehabilitation of the township section of the Territorial Creek which will result in the rehabilitation of the Shire of the creek's native water bird habitats and subsequently to an increase in the range and number of our native water bird species therein. On Sunday 29 July, a community clean up our creek day, which is supported by the Shire Council, Land Care and the Birdwashing Institute will focus on the hand removal of residual rubbish and other foreign objects, as well as non-natural obstructions to water flow. Subsequently, councils, parks and gardens, staff and trained volunteers, using heavy equipment, will focus on the removal of remaining foreign objects and non-natural obstructions to water flow, as well as a reduction in the build-up of excess saltation. On the completion of these works, the Institute will make, recommend to township residents and the Shire Council that the daily limit of water usage for gardens be reduced from two hours to one hour, with a difference to be released into the creek and thus to complete the creek's rehabilitation. A complementary initiative under development is focusing on the recommended reintroduction of native forest species into the creek's banks and adjoining lands which would result in an increase in the range and number of our native land bird species therein. The combined effect of these initiatives would be the creation of a major international bird watching tourism attraction in the very heart of our township. A first and important step to making our Shire Australia's must see bird watching destination. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. Peter, thank you for your presentation and we need to uh, uh, move on. I do invite you to morning tea. Please stay there. I just want to clarify something, Peter, to do yes. with our CE and, and um, our uh, senior staff to do with the paragraph you got in there and I'll hand over to Terry to just address the meeting on the comment you've made there. Right. Uh, three, <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll just make one question in relation to if the water usage was reduced uh, from two to one hours and that difference released from the creek, whose meters would they go through and who would be paying for that water put into the creek? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. This is just one of the options and the funding of that would have to be discussed. There are other options one could consider, like for instance that uh, residents would have on-off days based on odd 
even numbers of houses and so on. Um, that is a recommendation, and once that recommendation was made, council and the residents would consider the implications thereof. I cannot answer today um, who would pay for that water, but clearly if we do everything else to rehabilitate the creek and therefore the habitats for the birds, and we don't have the water, all that time and work will be in vain. Uh, if we're going to have a healthy, what I call birdland in the middle of our township, it needs water. And one thing that's lacking at the, mo the moment is water flow and quality of water. And it's just complicated because of obstructions like falling fence posts and pieces of pipe and so on. Pedro, I, I thank you for your reply and I wish you well in your endeavours. Once again, councillors, to make Thank you very much. I met with Peter this morning for mm -hmm. half an hour to talk about lots of things. And I do wish you well in your endeavours to work uh, closely with the council and the community and, and, and what you want to achieve with this. And I really mean that. But please, the invitation's there to stay for Smogo. And, uh, and I'm sure you wish to meet the rest of the councillors and if they've got any questions for you. Thank you very much. Councillors, we move on and I, I do need a, um, a motion to suspend standing orders. We'll do a citizenship ceremony and then we'll break the smoke up. So I'd like to have a motion along them lines. Councillor Sawyer, I thank you. Second by Councillor Berry, I thank you. All in favour? Thank you. Hey, huh? Just... I would like to. Hello. Councillors and ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Mr. David and Christopher Jones, who are, uh, are doing the, the um, citizenship today. As Mayor, I would like to acknowledge traditional custodians, custodians of this land who are meeting on today. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, of the Jacobo, Camilleroy and Bunjilung nations and extend their respect to other Aboriginal people present. Apologies have been received from the Honourable Barnaby Joyce MP, Member for New England, the Honourable Thomas George MP, Member for Lismore, the Honourable Peter Dutton, Minister for Home Affairs and Senator John Williams, Senator for New South Wales. But we're unable to attend the ceremony due to prior commitments. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the citizenship ceremony of David and Christopher Jones. This citizenship ceremony has been conducted as prescribed in the Australian Citizenship Act 2016. And the Australian Citizenship Regulations Act 2016 under the authority of the Minister of Home Affairs. As presiding officer, I've been approved under the Act to administer the Pledge of Commitment as a citizen of the Commonwealth of Australia, which is the final step for you becoming an Australian citizen. This is a message from the Honourable Peter Dutton MP, Minister for Home Affairs. State Australia stands proud in today's world, recognised by defending the values, rights and obligations which stand us in good stead for as long as we embrace them. The history and culture of Australia has been forged over thousands of years, first for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and more recently, with people from the four corners of the earth. Australians are proud of having survived and thrived as a nation following the cruelty of wars, depression, drought and flood. As a result of this rich history today, we stand with other strong democracies to help defend and protect our hard-fought freedoms. People of all backgrounds and religions strengthen our country and only together, united, will our future be as strong as our present and past. Thank you for taking this important step. Australian citizenship, citizenship confers on you great benefits, but quality rights and obligations. Congratulations and best wishes. Australian citizenship represents full and formal membership of the community of the Commonwealth of Australia. And Australian citizenship is a common bond involving reciprocal rights and obligations uniting all Australians while respecting their diversity. Persons on whom Australian citizenship is conferred enjoy these rights and undertake to accept these obligations. By pledging loyalty to Australia and its people, by sharing their democratic beliefs, and by respecting their rights and liberties, and by upholding and obeying the laws of Australia. The act of requiring Australian citizenship is a solemn act of law. You are about to undertake a new commitment, a new responsibility. 
You're about to take on a new status here in Australia, wherever you may travel in the world. It is a status of which you may be proud of, a status in a nation which is vigorous and independent. As an Australian, you will be a member of the community, which is democratic, in which everyone has equal rights and freedom and opportunity. We all need to belong to a family or a community, to share a past and hold common hopes and goals for the future. By becoming an Australian citizen, you are showing that you want to have a say in Australia's future. No one who applies for Australian citizenship is expected to renounce their cultural identity, customs or traditions. Australia's heritage is made richer by contributions from people by, from many lands. In making the Australian Citizenship Pledge, you become an Australian citizen and promise your glory to Australia and its people. You undertake to share Australia's democratic beliefs, to respect Australia's rights, liberties and uphold and obey this nation's laws. You will have a clear duty to join with other Australians whatever needed in civic duties which are for the good of everyone. It is my duty to remind you that every right also has responsibilities. Only if we accept our duty as Australian citizens can we make sure that the rights of ourselves and our children are protected now and in the future. And now we'll do the pledge. And all we need to do is, is just to repeat after me. Ready? Yep. Good. <laughs> From this time forward, under God. From this time forward, under God. From this time forward, under God. You can do it together if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge my Lord to Australia and its people. I pledge my Lord to Australia and its people. Much better. <laughs> whose democratic beliefs I share. <laughs> whose rights and liberties I respect and. Whose laws I will uphold and obey. I welcome you as Australian citizens of Australia and congratulate you on the decision to take up Australian citizenship. As a citizen of Australia, you are now formally identified with this country, its people and its governments. You have made a pledge of commitment to Australia and its people and you have been provided with a memento card to mark the occasion of that commitment. Australian citizens value many basic rights, including equality of treatment, equality under the law, democracy and equal opportunity for all. Citizenship is open to all Australians permanent residents who satisfy the requirements for the agreement of citizenship on the Australian Citizenship Act 2016, as you have done. Now that you are a citizen, there is no difference between you and any other citizen concerning your rights, privileges and responsibilities. Australia gives all Australians the opportunity to live and grow in a free and open society and to share in common good. In return, we owe Australia our duty as good neighbours and good citizens. Our future success as Australians depends on the way we work together. This act of law is now completed, and on behalf of all Australians, I congratulate you and hope you have a happy and successful future as Australian citizens. Congratulations again. Okay. Well, uh, Councillors, if you would be outstanding for the national anthem, when we get it happening.
everyone. Please well, welcome to Smargo and we invite our, our new citizens of Australia. Okay, councillors. Order, please. I'll bring the, the meeting back to order. Right, motion, please, to resume. Councillor Tom Peters, I thank you. Second, please. Councillor Gary Herbert, I thank you all in favour. Councillor, I do want to thank you for uh, uh, this morning and for taking morning tea. But one thing I do respect is um, we were asking that they didn't have questions. Well, there was a time frame. We had to keep going in the questions and I hope they did to with their presenters to talk and ask them questions through morning tea. So please respect that. Those decisions need to be made. But it's a challenge as chairperson to keep the meeting. Um, going along and on time, and uh, so I appreciate your support there. Get back to our uh, to the board of business councillors. Next up on the item is on the uh, agenda is our mayoral minute. I do have a mayoral minute, and uh, and I will ask for a seconder. Chief Executive Mr. Terry Lodge will be proceeding on annual leave for the period of Thursday, 5th of July, 2018, to Sunday, 22nd of July, inclusive between the work on Monday, 23rd of July. During this period, Chief Operating Officer Ms. Colin Smith will be acting as Chief Executive during Mr. Dodd's absence. The delegation of Council to the General Manager need to be conferred on the Acting Chief Executive under Section 337 of the Local Government Act. And the recommendation is the Council approve the temporary appointment of Chief of Corporate Officer Colin Smith to the position of Acting Chief Executive for the period 5th of July 2018 to Sunday 22nd of July 2018, excluding inclusive. Councillors, it is a mayoral minute with my respect and full support of a democratic right. I will ask for a second. Councillor Greg Sawyer, and thank you. All in favour? Thank you, councillors. Mm -hmm. Recommendations for items be considered in the confidential section, councillors. We have no confidential in this meeting. Open council reports. Councillors, we move on in your hard copy. We move to page 7 in your hard copy. It's item COM 6. Slash 18, the drought management plan revised. And I uh, can I move and second to deal with this item, please. Councillor Ryan Murray, I thank you. Second to Councillor Mike Victory, and I thank you. And a hand over to our uh, Chief Operating Officer. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. So, this report is effectively about bringing up to speed and updating a drought management plan that we have had in place since 2010. Um, if you have a quick breeze through the report, you'll uh, see from the background that uh, when we went through the initial setting in place of the drought management plan, as for what we would normally do, we would do a draft, we would take out of the community, we would uh, do what's needed in terms of uh, incorporating those changes into something that's a workable document. We've been through that process, but uh, those plans are normally updated every five or six years. We're well and truly overdue for an update and certainly when we had a look at the previous uh, version there, there, there was some scope for improvement but not wholesale scope that would change the overall tenor of what we had and what you see there uh, in terms of uh, the, the summary of changes in the right up in the executive summary front section there it's mainly just an updating of the tables. Um, look, normally right across the New England, but I've seen quite consistently that uh, in terms of our drought response, there's five levels of uh, emergency response. They're colour-coded, that's uh, pretty well widely known out in the community, from blue uh, being level one, rising up to level five red emergency. Right? Now, those colours have been reflected um, in both the urban bill and the tender bill drought management uh, situation. So, We've got consistency there, Council. So, uh, to me, the document reads reasonably well. I'm going to be able to the questions. Question to, to our uh, Chief Operating Officer to do with the report, Councillors. Councillor Gary Berry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I see you. Uh, uh, look, I'm just, just playing, I'd like to add a little bit to that because what, the report's very comprehensive, but it doesn't look at the Council. <coughs> And I don't believe if you're going to look at uh, what the future of any of it, you've got to look at the future of the uh, For example, Land Hills and Edmund, Flat Hills, San Antonio, Texas, they're being paid to keep the pace of clear of uh, timber. It's also experience has shown by removing tall woody vegetation out of rough areas, don't you get an increase in stream flow? And I think things like that should be noted. Now to do that, what are we going to do? We're going to put the bond 
public display to actually look at the catchment or can we do that, let us say, here today? Uh, three years, Mayor. Councillor, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about you know, management of the catchment. Um, that said, there is uh, legislation in place in terms of clearing and the likes. Um, you know, people notwithstanding that most of the catchment is private land. Um, uh, certainly in the Tenfield area, that's the case. Um, you know, people just can't start, go out and wholesale uh, clear their land. There are constraints on the amount of clearing that you can do. So uh, I think a lot of that's reasonably taken care of. Uh, that, that said, uh, you know, in terms of um, you know, the introduction of poisons and that sort of thing, I, I think that's something once again too that you know, the, the likes of the Department of uh, Primary Industry or the likes would be oversighting that sort of thing in any case. So I'm not sure if this document is the document to be sort of trying to uh, look at those you know, wider issues, but, but I am hearing you that you know, catchment is obviously a clear. Right, for, for, for these for these water water you know reserves, um, and yeah, but I, but I don't believe this is the document to sort of trying to have that discussion. You've got other legislative legislation out there. You've got other bodies that are looking at that sort of thing. Good, of course, we can. Unfortunately, the authority is looking at it in the wrong way. They're looking at it to increase the amount of vegetation rather than decrease the amount of vegetation. In San Antonio, the land allocators have paid to get rid of the vegetation. And I think we should be yeah, either documenting something like that or sending a very clear message to our state government. They're going about looking after catchments in the wrong way. Yes, I can you. I want to I wonder is it something that we should pursue? I'm happy to. Um, this through through our our some sort of our, as a motion at a conference or something like that or or direct your department. I, I fully agree with this. I'll get to you, Councillor <laughs> Fully agree, uh, agree because we're be careful. We're dealing with the officer's recommendation. Yeah. You're mentioning yeah. something that, to me, I'm not saying it's outside, but that's what we're, that's what we're asking. The officer's got a recommendation there. Um, if you want to put a change in there, or that be accepted, uh, you know, by our council, the councillors, and uh, and obviously by the uh, author of that being Conrad. Yeah. So that's all I'm, I'm uh, advising there. That's why I also and. And happy to pursue something like that if that's the will of our council. Yeah, well, all I was suggesting was we should know something like that in, in there if we know. I think that would be a good question whether we can know something like that in a report like this. I don't know. It's for future generations rather than our generation. I'm certainly happy to put up a motion for you to take to the. Uh, yeah, yeah, so far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then with the passion that you have for Councillor Berry, I'm seeing what you had, I mean, Happy to work with you in that. No, that's what I, I personally think something like that was hit and see what sort of, um, of um, uh, you know, support we get, you know, at, at such a, a, a gathering of, of our state, which I think it's in there at our state uh, conference. Councillor Brown, have you indicated? I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that, well, that's the point. It's the point of both Andre and um, I think on the you correct this document as it is. As a, as a, you couldn't get a change on that today. Yeah. And um, I'm going to thank you very much for what you've done to make that um, a very welcome document. And in support of Councillor Berry, it actually will be in our lifetime because unfortunately, with the new land management codes that have come into place with the um, you know, the vegetation change yeah. and the legislation, there's now, uh, when on the end owner goes to do uh, one of their codes, you're now seeing a 20 metre buffer each side of all drainage lines. Now, previously it was only prescribed streams under the Salt Conservation Act and through the Protected Lands um, section for 1972. Now, that, uh, and that's what we've been arguing is the fact that they will actually create, particularly in steeper land, um, as we all know, we've got too many trees, you get less ground covers. When you get less ground covers, you get heavy ground and you'll get a road. So they're actually going to create the road and create facilitation and reduce um, uh, stream flow. So it's this mindset that all it's this tree centric mindset, but trees in the wrong place are bad. So I'd be happy if Council Verney and myself as one of our councils work together. It's it's more than a motion of conference. We've got to do um, I think a, a bit of a document, get some photos, demonstrate what we're talking about, 
with all the information that Gary has on how many litres per day you are losing in each of these drainage lines when you have too many trees. And um, certainly some trees are good, but not, not just blanket 40 metres fences and stuff throughout our entire shire. It's going to be a big nightmare and uh, a catastrophe waiting to happen. So, and we pursue it through our local members um, as well as through the conference. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just pass over to OC for some comment, councillors. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, it may be worthwhile putting on um, the agenda for the next um, brainstorming session, <coughs> uh, such that we can make sure that uh, nothing's uh, left off uh, in the document and uh, uh, do it two or three times because the, um, the intellectual property uh, for this type of thing, um, uh, I suspect that a lot of it would fall with. Councillor Petrie and Councillor Beery, they know quite a lot about this. Um, if we were to discuss in the next uh, brainstorming session, we can uh, get all the questions and, and make sure we get a, a, a robust uh, document. I think that's good advice, and, and thank you for, so yeah, for those comments. And I, I, we're allowed to warm workshops in here, aren't we? Uh, yeah, there's an order Have they technically changed that yet? It's in draft. <laughs> <laughs> God, God bless them. Okay, councillors, and um, to both councillors uh, to support our seat, to Councillor Barry and uh, Councillor Brown, thank you. We are lucky to be the, the experience and um, that you're having those areas, and that's what makes this council strong. So we will look forward to that. And happy to be to be supportive of that. Um, all in favour with the, the officer's recommendation? Against? Councillor, you're in oh, yeah. Thank you. It's all right. Page 11, councillors. We move on to item COM 7 slash 18, Donation Chatfield Care Centre. Um, can I move a second to deal with this item, please? Councillor Brian Petrie, second, please. Councillor Brian Murray, thank you. And I'll hand over to our CE to present this document. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, look, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's uh, philosophically a little bit tricky though, um, as um, one of the reasons that we've got the policies in place um, that we do uh, is to prevent um, uh, this type of thing. But on the flip side of the coin, um, it's important that uh, uh, council uh, gets carried over the decision because it's, a, it's an unusual set of circumstances, so that's why we Thank you, Questions to our CE to do with the report? Will we have comment, Councillor? I think it's a, a, a great move and um, I think to support this occasion and to support uh, what's happening at Haddington and has been happening at Haddington. And I moved here 33 years ago, I think. Yeah, 33 years ago. And I was really struck at that time that. Um, in so many things, and one of the things was Cole May, and she said to me, anything we've got in terms of we've had to fight for. Because <coughs> we were at the end of nowhere, being so far from Sydney, and being close actually to the system and anywhere else. So anything in from the hospital to the bill raise to to whatever happened to be, the community <coughs> here has had to band together and do it. So I think in recognition of how successful and how wonderful it is to have Paddington here, and having to um, had to extricate my um, and see started all from a nursing home in Stanford and taking the children and then we actually got him back to Haddington where they were wonderful to eat. We even must be kept up to the hallways for it because he thought it was too rocky. And, um, but having been able to bring your relative back here and that would never have occurred without people such as Colman driving and um, in recognition of how successful Haddington and your race is going on, it was fantastic for I think we should support it. more questions, councillors, to, to the report? Just to sum up, um, in the Greens, in the Atlantic conversation with the CEO yesterday, going through our business paper, uh, fully support this going forward. I just want to note a couple of things um, to be supportive of this happening, and uh, in the Greens with the comment from, from Councillor Bromman, people, Colin Hearn and, and the effort that was done by the committee to the setup of, of, of this, and, and now uh, being the second largest employer in our town, is, not, is one thing I do know. And growing all the time with the extension that will be there, which is fine in council. But you know, um, I, I really mean everything to say. But the other thing I do want to note, you know, in a financial annual budget, that community contribution donations will be increased by 2,500 because it's where this is coming from. 
So there's still thirty five thousand dollars, but that's very important for our community. She's the only top that our community clubs and and uh, whichever they are have an opportunity to apply for council to get some funding to do whatever. We all know that hundred dollars goes away in small community. The only thing I will need to know is that we need to be very very careful, and it's not negative. It's just a, a comment that we don't make precedent of this. And, and uh, then, then we get jumped off of every other community want to acknowledge someone, and we do the same for them. So it's a, if it's a warning, then that's what it is. Well, I'm fully supportive of, of it happening. Any other comment, councillors? No? The reports there in front of you, the councillors, all happy to receive a note. Against? Carried. Thank you. Page 13, your hard copy, councillors, is item EC. Zero twelve slash eighteen inland rail conference, uh, eighteen ninth of July at Parks. I move the second one, please, to do this one. Councillor Gary Berry, second one, Councillor Greg Sawyer. I thank you, and I hand over to our CEO to present this one. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, this is pretty straightforward. Um, the inland rail is going to significantly uh, change the transport paradigm from predominantly north south uh, to introducing more east west. Um, when um, this was spoken to uh, at um, the recent conference and also uh, through the joint organisation, um, it was considered important enough um, for us to attend so that uh, we can bring information back to Tenerfield Shire for our future planning. Uh, in particular, related to uh, the Bruxman Way and the Board of Regional Organisation of Councils and the $20 million um, for uh, developing uh, cross-border relationships. So the more we know about what's going on with the uh, railway, uh, the more uh, prepared we'll be uh, to address those other issues. Questions, councillors? Councillor Berry? Question to whoever. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, Kenfield was part of the Cunningham group of councils which looked at an alternative group to the ARTC group which uh, started at Rolton and went up uh, along Mercia Parallel from Mount Lindsay Road to <coughs> Pillowview, Nekalani, and followed the existing route out west. So that was one of the routes. The other one was probably the uh, existing train line south. Yeah. I just wonder if we have a copy of that route or a copy of that uh, Cunningham report somewhere. How far back were you on council? It would have to be
Is it near us? No. Does it, does it affect us? Yes, it does, and we need to know where it will be so into the future that we have a uh, great network that can uh, support such a thing. That's what it's all about. And mentioning the, uh, with the newly formed uh, Brooks and Way Alliance Group, which I proudly chair, and uh, we're moving on really good with that in the early stages. So uh, I feel that that's, that's important for us to be there. So, so keep in contact with you. Yeah, question. So, yeah. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, perhaps um, well, the officer's recommendation could stand, um, but perhaps um, um, with the help of uh, Councillor Beery, uh, we could write down some words and formally uh, write to uh, ARA and ALC asking them the question and whether or not it could be included uh, for information on the agenda on the 18th. Uh, somewhere on the 18th and 19th of July. Yeah. Yeah. I will see if I can get some information. Uh, if you want information about the coming in group of council, yeah. uh, I, know, I think I know where I can find it. That would be good. Yeah. And fully support the CE suggestion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, councillors, any more questions, comment? On the recommendations there, councillors, all happy to endorse against the carry. Thank you. Councillors, we move on to page 15. It's the item EMV 13 slash 18 to do with the amendment to the uh, technical development control plan 2014 signage and handful advertising. Can I have a move and second here to deal with this item, please? Mm -hmm. Councillor Coleman, Patrick, thank you. Second, please. Councillor Mike, Patrick, thank you. And um, I will hand over to our senior planner, Mike, and welcome, Mike, as always. Thank you. Thank you. This report is presented to Council to seek a resolution to place the draft amendments to the signage component of our development control plan on public exhibition for the year of 28 days. Um, as you can see in the report, this has been a bit of an ongoing and a long, uh, long drawn out procedure, but we, we've received comments back from the Roads and Maritime Services and uh, met with the, the local chamber to discuss the amendments that Council had proposed after a workshop. I will note there is one correction. Um, in the council's resolution, there was a um, it was noted to delete flags, bunting, or the like from the pre-bid signs table. Uh, and I do note in the attachment that bunting is actually listed separately, so that will need to be deleted in line with that resolution. Uh, it was actually incorporated with flags and bunting in a table um, in that original table, so it was also listed twice. So, in accordance with that council resolution, the bunting should come out of that pre-bid signs list. Um, Open to any questions. Question to the same same planner. Um, I'll go with Councillor Roman Patrick. Yeah, as a person who first moved this amendment, um, I was actually happy for bunting to have stayed in pretty but it was just it was in that one line item and it was after we went through I thought, oh bunting's that little lady stuff that you usually see around car car yards. So if everyone else was happy, I'm perfectly comfortable with leaving bunting in as pretty budget. Um, it, it just it happened to be in the flags bunting and the like, and the issue at the time with the, the wooden banners. So if everyone was happy that bunting is not a suitable type thing to have here, and we actually don't have any in town anyway, that kind of, um, I'm, happy, I'm perfectly comfortable to leave bunting in as prohibited. But I just have a few um, clarifications if that's what I made. Yeah, to, to do with the report, yeah, yeah. Um The development consent for the sign. Well, that makes me feel 15 years after the consent will have. So, do you mean after every 15 years, you'll have to reapply for the existing signs? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the 15 year provisions come into play when it's done under the state policy, which relates to the rural roads. What we have done in the past is we've allowed the consent to run for 15 years with an option for them to come back to us and modify it to extend it on after that. It really is an allowance that after 15 years, if we end up with a derelict sign, that it can be removed legally. So there is, is an option put in there for applicants to uh, come back uh, and amend their current consent to allow it to continue on if it's operating and it's, it's been kept up to date. So, I mean, thank you. Welcome back, Just wondering how you know. So that's the rural signage, not every sign in town, kind of thing. Do you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. You know? And it would be on the condition of consent that they would be given that option to, to continue on after that 15 years. Right, except for the, um, the ones that are deemed permissible anyway. So they're only ones that you need to DR. Yeah, okay. The other quick question. Um, overhead banners. So the overhead banners is on Carnegie Beach. 
that page, the one above the prohibited signs, four dot points above, it says that within banners, bungee mobile plates, and inflatable objects are not acceptable. But overhead banners, you know, I mean the little banners that people have got on their computers, is that some big overhead, you massive thing, is it? During the screen, that's correct. I would, okay. Um, any sign located above the, about the last, second last dot point, the one just above the red? Any sign located over the footpath which is lower than 2.6 metres above the footpath. So that brings us back into question. The two little flags on the news agent and no rider. So if we have that there, any sign, mm -hmm. the lake will come there. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make some clarification in terms of the um, perhaps the insurance implication because the 2.6 metres is, is listed or is the height for safety reasons for all signage normally. Um, obviously, those types of signs are a little bit different. Um, whether we can exclude those as part of that, if Council you know, wish to, we, we possibly could. We just have to check through the insurance. Um, yes, I mean, you obviously don't want to be stuck up here, but I thought there reasonably insignificant signs. Talking to the guy at the time, they said that that little sign gives them so much of their passing traffic because people see it and they go, oh, there's no guide here. So I go, I'm just wondering whether there needs to be make a little clarification there. Um, I think I've got a problem with uh, the vertical or horizontal projecting wall signs but it says Council Heritage Advisor will determine the effectiveness of signage. I would prefer that says provide recommendation. I don't think one person should make a determination. Um, that's in the little entry bits um, uh, for the vertical or horizontal projecting wall signs because, um, I mean, this is, we've got the projects over here, it's been six or seven years since they've put in the DA, they've had three different heritage advisors in that time, some have given completely opposite directives. So I would like to see a heritage advisor who is simply an advisor determine. I think that's up to the heritage advisor to, re to provide recommendation rather than determine. And it is then up to our senior staff to make the decision or if it needs necessarily come to the council. And I'm not sure how everyone feels like that, but I do have out that. But I would like to see that determined change to provide recommendation. But sorry, anyway, back to my questions. Corporate building signs, it says painting built in the, in the box. Um, in the table, painting buildings with that proper colour things as a for retention is considered an extension and will not be permitted. I mean, obviously, we've got the minor tin issue all the time, and we know the new owner would like to have it changed, but it's a matter of cost or anything else. We've also got the still signage, um, which is not obviously is in, in your face, and you've got the novelty sign across the page as still prohibited and you've also got the still chainsaw. So is existing use excused? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, anything that is existing at this point in time will continue on those provisions. So this will only come into play with any proposed new signage. Uh, and really the, the corporate building signage, the colours, is to really prevent um, some time ago when photo shops used to be around, there used to be a bright pink um, photo premises business. And they used to come into some rural towns and paint the entire building with the facade in a bright pink. So it was to really avoid those, um, you know, I guess, out of the ordinary corporate um, painting schemes that come into effect. It is, in some ways, it's, it's, it's already regulated through the heritage conservation area and heritage listed buildings because they do require consent to repaint anyways. I was just wondering what they should be, will be, will not be committed without consent. Council, what are you, I'm sorry. So in that table? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The second, the second last one, corporate building signs. It says, and will not be committed. Yeah. I was just yeah. wondering whether we should have words without consent. I'm not sure. So please be careful. What did you just say? Um, at the end, so corporate building yes. signs, painting buildings with like corporate colour schemes, <coughs> to draw attention to the building, is considered to be an extension of advertising signage. And will not be committed. However, Mr. Mayor said some things have been committed with consent in that prohibited list. Yep. So I'm just wondering whether we should actually add the words there without consent. As instead of reason. instead of will not be permitted. Not be <laughs> not to allow the fact that it might be a corporate colour, might be a, a I'm trying to think of a business thing 
that's not my opportunity to build. It's something that actually is not in your place and is quite normal for to put on a, yeah. on a building. So I'm just wondering, is that acceptable to have that and tiny and plan up as well? Well, my plan, and I'll come to you in a minute, my question is, is because of that, with the officer's recommendation, that um, the amendment to the provision is on part of the exhibition of 28 days, in that 28 day period, is that, is that the time to do something <coughs> or, or in a submission, let's call it, to make a, uh, a suggestion to change this thing, or do we, or do we suggest it here, just to say you can in any time? Mr. Mayor, there's, there's both options. So obviously the council have, council have looked at the, the plan previously yeah. in the workshop. Those recommendations were taken on board and put into the, yeah. the policy. We go back out now on public exhibition. Yeah. We come back to council again after that. So yeah. whether there's submissions from the public um, or council wants to make changes before, that, that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. There is another opportunity. We'll come back to council for final adoption to incorporate any recommended changes yeah. after that exhibition. And group of problems to say that the council lose are quite entitled to be involved in this process. Yes? No, yes, uh, or uh, at, at any stage. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was just wondering. So, that's what I was wondering whether it would be more appropriate if, if as Tamay said, some things do get permitted yes. with consent, whether yeah. we just have those with consent so that any new business here or any existing business, instead of meeting that go, oh, I can never put a certain colour on my outside. Outside, I'm one kind of kid, please. But, do you want to do it here or are we going to do it? So I just don't with, with consent, if, if, is, if it is possible to have a colour with consent, just so that people who want to read in this can say, oh, well, I can apply to council to do my corporate building colour and I can either get knocked back or approved. Well, the way you read this is just not, it will never be allowed. Well, it says it will not be permitted, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dear Mr. Mayor, if I could make a suggestion perhaps, if we want to take it out of the table, because the table actually does state prohibited and it says do not contribute. So it could be removed and then placed in the, the section above that just says that signs are not acceptable uh, along those lines except with consent. So it sort of puts it into the realm of, look, we're not really encouraging it, however there may be opportunity with a certain certain development. Just that it's not listed in prohibited because it's quite clear it says you know, do not contribute and are prohibited and we've got the list. If you put an out clause in it, it's not really prohibited. If that makes sense. Yeah. Mr. So, yeah. uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, perhaps uh, what Councillor Petrie is saying is that if the corporate colours match up with the heritage um, uh, palette, um, technically speaking, that'd be okay for the heritage group that are listed in the prohibited, they wouldn't be okay. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so again, if, if there's a colour scheme that's not in your face and not going to be detrimental to our streetscape, yeah. yeah. then I can't see why we would refuse to, to have it on there. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, to me, it's offered really good advice there, I think, to, to go on those lines. I think that would work. Yeah. 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 With that suggestion? Yeah, that would, that would be good. And, and I mean, I know that the, the only odd shape something got is the steel one, and yep. that would be covered by Probably existing use. Yes. Yes. The other little clarification was flashing signs. You know, we've got, I mean, how they've got the little, the real yeah. tiny, yeah. insignificant yeah. labels. So technically, they would be prohibited. prohibited. Yes, we do not want big flashing open signs on some of our heritage buildings that we have seen at all. But uh, little tiny things, do we just get rid of them there, the Chinese shop, and someone else has a little tiny okay. thing? Okay. 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 I mean, they would be technically not in Asia. Well, the main last year from was, is there, a, is there a size with those signs, or was it all those? Or? Through Mr. Mayor, it's all of them as it stands at the moment. Okay. Okay. And my final question is the motel on page oh, one that says it's on the right hand side it says signs on business or industrial premises. Your M in O. O says it must not be internally illuminated unless it's located on a motel hotel outside the heritage conservation area. Now the Peter Allen Motel opposite. 
I believe it has got an internal illuminated sign. So, so the, these are the signs of Fatima Hotel yep. inside. Yep. Now, could they have pulled their sign down? Or, I mean, it's just a little bit odd that every other motel would have that sign because they happen to be within that block. Well, it might be in the pre existing but tomorrow. Right. That's right. And the yeah. other one, of course, is the Royal, which I know no longer yeah. operates as a pub, but it's got Rob Oryx and stuff like that. And, and, yeah. So, hearing Mr. Mayor, that the development control plan provisions aren't retrospective, so they won't come in and require any existing signage. And the Peter Allen sign and the Royal sign, I know, actually have development consent because I've seen the historic files. So, they will continue to operate under those consent provisions. If they do a redevelopment and they want to come in and discuss signage together, we can certainly talk to them about that. But we're not going to go out there and require them to, to comply with this today. So, they can still continue on. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So, do I get an answer on? Heritage advisor, can we change the word from determined to advise recommendation? Well, would that be a time? I mean, I would, I, would, um, I would be supportive of your question, Councillor, in that, that any advice would be, be a recommendation going to Councillor, not that they've made the decision. Am I correct in saying that this is the area? That's what I would imagine, but I don't like the word that, that one person can determine the appropriate advice. Mm -hmm. uh, three, three, Mr. Mann, I'll, I'll let the senior plan answer that. I have no uh, philosophical problem with it being um, uh, advised uh, to the council, meaning the council staff, and if there's something that's um, uh, obviously if there's something that's way outside um, the realm, uh, council staff uh, may choose to, or, or have to, or may choose to uh, have the council determine if it's um, a little bit unusual. Uh, but I'd leave it open to to May to make comment on it. Through Mr. Mayor, well, we can certainly remove the determinant, it's probably a fairly strong wording, and, and the advice that we get from Heritage Wildlife is advice in all instances, anyway. So if there's no determination made by the advisor, it's made through recommendations to the staff and the delegation or to council to determine. So we can remove that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Berry, you've indicated. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Mr. Mayor, this is the senior town plan. No, senior plan, to answer. Yeah, to me, I've had a few complaints about the quality of some of our signs around the field. Now, unless you could complain in, I said, you know, the best thing to do is pick a complaint into not to pay a submission. Can we actually determine the quality of the signs that people are putting up, as in the font and everything else? What the font, font, yeah. No, it means with the word. It's all about through Mr. Mayor, that the current provisions that we have in play are, are, are situated in this document here. So, in terms of needing consent or prior consent, they still are in play. In terms of any regulatory or um, any action on any signage, uh, as per that council resolution in 2016, we haven't actually taken any action, um, particularly in relation to any flight acts or funding. Um, what we'd like to do is try to work with shop owners, business owners, the chamber, to try to get a, a higher standard to all of our signage that we've currently got. Uh, and I've been speaking with, uh, um, with Harry Bolton about that in terms of trying to be a bit more proactive um, across all the businesses, um, that we do have a consistent approach to signage, that it looks tidy, that it looks neat, and it encourages people to come into the businesses in town. Yeah, I'll have that, Councillor. Yeah, um, uh, senior plan. With the uh, advent of these TV screens, how can we... TV screens to use that for advertising, I should clarify myself. How can we determine what they're getting from those things? Because you, you can put a whole great big heap of uh, paraphernalia on those signs, like there's one in Stanton with the motel, it's uh, quite large, I think it's about five foot, six foot square or something like that for size. So I was just wondering, do we review what uh, all the stuff they're going to put on there? Or is it, it's going to be difficult, I presume, for uh, police that type of thing. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not aware that we have any currently in the Shire. If, if they were proposed, part of the assessment process with the application is for them to identify what will be on that signage. Whether it's a static sign or a moving sign, we need to know the content of that signage so that it can be regulated. So that if they do go outside the realms, they start advertising a business that's potentially outside the Shire or is not in keeping with the original consent, that's when the regulatory process would come into play. 
more questions to to uh, to make to do with the report, councillors. I have a suggestion, councillors, and chat me down if you wish. If it's only a word to show that we are um, uh, supportive and proactive in what we do, and it is the word that in the officer's recommendation, the council places technical development control plan amendments to science provisions on proactive public display the exhibition for 28 hours. Do you want to proactive in it? I'll go anywhere. Up to you. Just a word. Leave it as is. Proactive. It's just a word saying that, that, that this, the whole document is proactive. We're proactive. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Well, it's just a proactive before amendment. Oh, that's cool. It's just a proactive. The council placed a tentative development control plan. Or the proactive. Proactive public display means that you go out there actively doing something other than just doing the public display. Well, so, what you're saying is the signage amendments are proactive, aren't they? Of course, they are. Yeah. We have spent, we have so spent, just got proactive in the last spot. We have spent a long time doing this, council. And, and to, to my own, the department's credit to come back, and it's, it, it, it's not a straight from a band that fixes this. This goes back a long time. And due to the, the, due to the uh, council, councillors and our staff listening, to our business people, that there was an issue. That's what that's what brought this report. Correct me if I'm wrong. So that's that's all I'm asking. Once again, did you put proactive before tenant? The council placed the proactive tenant development well, control plan. No, you care. I don't want to make a big debate about just about a word. I'll take you. I'm sorry. So in terms of the the placing on public exhibition, that's actually the happening. So, of course, we will be proactive in our in our exhibition. Um, given the fact, too, that that is the officer's recommendation, council may wish to actually um, develop a motion um, of yeah. which they support to place those amendments um, within that document so that then we can actually go out and advertise. So, I said it's more about the, the legislative requirement of yes. the advertising as opposed to, to being proactive. And we will be proactively advertising and engaging in conversations. <laughs> Mr. Mayor is trying to say that these signage amendments have been a proactive step forward yep. in, in improving for our business people. And yes. um, um, yeah, that's just where you put that. We have identified that in here, so this is a, 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 you know, a move forward for the business people. Yep. Thank you, Sir Humphrey. Councillor Murray. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I think that somehow or other, I agree with you. The word yes. proactive is good, but we should be known as a proactive council yes. in general terms. Yes. So we could put that in as opposed to. So I was talking to you. I suggest the media release. Maybe that's what they can. One of the proactive business people will be the media release. Yes. Yeah. Well, our media is here, so. I hope that the council is proactive. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll step away from that now because it's going to be a big debate. Yes, Councillor Berry. Just wondering, we should stick the word passive in there as well. Passive <laughs> Can I recommend Council the Council Sorry. Officer's recommendation stays in situ and we vote on it? Yes. Yeah. I will. <laughs> Please the right now. Anyway, okay, Councillors, I'll step away from that to get on the Senate. The Council Place to Tenant Field, I mean, the Officer's recommendation there, all in favour, against guarantee. Thank you for, for the conversation and debate. Council 9, uh, Council 8, 9, item EN V 14 slash 18, um, to do with the former housing process and plan, Jim Disavala, Robert Benjamin, proposal under the contamination, contamin contaminated land and management act, 1997. Can I have a move and a second to deal with this, please? Councillor Brian Murray, thank you. Councillor Saganer, please. Councillor Mike Petrie, and I thank you. And I'll hand over to our Chief Operating Officer to present this, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillors, so this report is about the process for effectively tidying up and uh, dealing with the remnant of a fast production facility in our area. 
as you'd be aware, of in Jennings, we've had um, in days gone by an arsenic factory there, and uh, that is situated on land that uh, is effectively crowd control. The EPA has a responsibility um, to basically, I suppose, order these uh, matters, and that said, there is a process though to follow in terms of remediation of land and dealing with uh, remediation <coughs> issues. That's all outlined in the Contaminated Land Management Act 1997. EPA has done a, an audit of this site uh, and they're in the process of, or well, actually I should say Crown Lands have accepted that there is an issue there and they've accepted that something needs to be done. So they've uh, sought to effectively enter into a voluntary management proposal under the Act, which is all about the process of uh, getting something happening to tidy up and rectify the problem. So what has happened to date is that there's been uh, interaction with the stakeholders. Um, Council being one of those stakeholders because we have um, roads in and around the facility. There is a track that is being used, or it's not really a it's, they, they call it an easement in the document, but it's not really an easement at all. It's just a, a locally used track across the land, uh, and we have the council has some road reserve that crosses this land. So you'll see in the attachment councils there is uh, an overview of the voluntary agreement, and there's also a I think the very first page of the booklet. It shows a, a red bounded area, which is going to be the area that's impacted. So. Effectively going forward, councillors, this is all about uh, council accepting that A, there's a problem, and B, that we have a responsibility and a part to play in helping rectify the problem. By way of collaboration, and I'll say by collaboration meaning we've got our part to play, mainly to do with the, uh, basically the, the land that we've got as road reserve, uh, effectively taking that out of, uh, out of our road reserve register and uh, Having that, having that being impacted uh, as part of the process for the remediation. So, effectively, it's meant to be no cost to us councillors. Um, we, we as a, an organisation, simply have to go through the process, or it requires our cooperation uh, to to uh, be involved with the road reserve. Um, and they have indicated today, Crown Lands have indicated today, or I should say the Department, uh, the Department of Industry have indicated that our legal costs will be uh, recompensed. So I would commend the, uh, the motion to you and uh, happy to take questions. Questions to, to our uh, Chief Operating Officer to do with this uh, report, Councillors? Councillor Brian. Through you, Mr Mayor, to the Director. This can be neutralised, I presume, <coughs> that, I mean, this is Maybe not really, but maybe it is. Can it be neutralised? The arsenic. The arsenic, sorry, yes. Through you, Mr. Mayor, look, I'm not across the, uh, the, the actual detailed process of how they would uh, treat the soil or the like. You know, the first, first part of the process is to recognise where the land is uh, potentially contaminated, to create a buffer zone around that and then effectively uh, make sure that's fenced and so people don't go in there. And then what they choose to do with that land, whether they choose to take part of the uh, soil away and treat it, or whether they treat it in situ, or whether they're part of the process of remediation at this point in time is to purely limit the impact of community use so that the community's not, uh, not, not you know, the health's not uh, disadvantaged. Um, Bottom line is I can't directly answer the, the chemical process, but what I can say to you is that the process is about isolation to start with and uh, protection of community well-being. Do you have questions to all go to do the report? Councillor Ron, Patrick? Contrary to all those affected lots, those smaller lots, are they all belong to Crown Land, do they? Um, through Mr Mayor, I believe that to be the case, um, except like the blue section which was an extension of um, Gladstone Street, you can see there in blue, um, you'll see that little yellow strip, right, uh, I think in days have gone by there was some talk about, I suppose, just having that 
off our register of maintenance and the like, but um, it, it's not a, even though they talk about it in the, the voluntary document as a big easement, there's no such, there's, there is no such an easement there as such. It's, um, it's just something that has been occurred over time in terms of its use. Um, people take shortcuts all over the place. Uh, dare I say, you know, if you look at that orange section, uh, portion of Robinson Street. Well, that, that's not the maintained section of Robinson Street as such. It's not in council's intention to go and do more road works to extend that. Don't be surprised in the future that people take a shortcut through there as well. But that's, that's, that's just what the community does from time to time. No, sorry, I, I, I wasn't worried about the tracks. I was just um, like the little red line is the proposed boundary of what they're going to do. And but I was just wondering because house blocks on the right hand corner, they must all, I presume, still be crown owned then to be able to put a fence up or they bought them up from affected persons or um, and I was just wondering when the arsenic factory shut down. When did I can tell you everything if you wish. Yep. Good. The history of that well I'll go even further. What I'd like to see and whether it be in, in a ad on this or personally I don't I don't because I always speak to sum up. In this document, but I'm happy to take it through to the uh, to the heritage where it should sit. Is that once this is done, I fully support the report, Robert. Okay? Um, there is history out there. That's where the arsenic was was uh, produced there. That it was quickly been infestation of once then. It all came from there. You know, I have a document at home in a, in a magazine I read one day. I've kept it for that reason. It's a really good story, and that's that, that should be shared with the community. That was a very important time, and that's what made the quickly banned. Was that? And the ground. Okay, so that's all. That's why I was there. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose just presume those lots, even though there, there are separate, like obviously house lots, they must still be under crown control somehow for them to put, um, they're going to fence that in, I take it. And I'm just wondering, it does say the water's contaminated. Sorry, the, the ground is contaminated and any water coming off it will also be contaminated. Where does the water flow to? Oh, yeah, there's a left gully that's below, I think. Oh, uh, Creek, uh, No, Mrs. Carlin, the Creek that, that um, uh, it's right there when you take, when you take brush up as road. There's a gully in there, some roots there, but oh, yeah, you know, it's in lives. Oh, yeah, 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 but anyway, okay, any more questions to one minute? Um, Councillor Peters. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, <coughs> Councillor Peters. Oh, yeah, as far as I know, a few years ago there was a bit of remediation that was done on that site. There wasn't. Why did they need to do more? Didn't they do a proper job? Well, I think that without being an expert on it at all, I think they wanted to, with the map that showed, they wanted to wait to uh, just completely fence off the area and make it so it's identified by the councillor. And you are 100% correct, and council done that work. And I think it was to the sum of $30,000. And it was just put a hard stand, basically, captain. So uh, I'm fully supportive of continuing on, and that, that area won't be identified because we all know last school started in the ground. And uh, that's what they're dealing with, but it's mainly to fix off the area and identify that. I do all work. Councillor Reardon. Just to answer some of Council Murray's concerns, we were on the registration committee. I looked at the site down the Mile River, and most arsenic you measure in parts per million. Then they were measuring in percentages, and that the Crown leans or leaves part of the time, they decided they were going to fix it up. And guess what? They put all the uh, dams and contours in place, first all them come, and they washed it all away. Well, you know, yeah. So there have been kills down the creek down there from the Mile River one, but uh, there's, there's been no history of any uh, loss of in the Urban Mills journey, yes. so yeah. I presume everything's going to be okay there. Yeah. More questions to our officer to do the report? No uh, councillors? All happy to receive a note. Against carriage. Thank you. Councillors, move on to page 23. 23 in your hard copy. Copy. It's item GOV 47 slash 18, it's a monthly operation report for June 18. 
And I'll move to second the deal this item, please. Thank you, Tony. Councillor Sawyer, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Brian Murray, I thank you. And I hand over to the joy to see you to present this report. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I think we should uh, uh, open up to councillors for any uh, questions specifically. Uh, I don't really want don't really want it. It's worthwhile um, for time to go through a 140 page report. Um, but I will bring councillors' attention to section D, emerging issues, risks, and opportunities, on page 15. And I ask that council be across that. Uh, any questions I'll take them. Questions to I see to do with the report with operational, monthly operational plan. You're indicated, Councillor? Well, you're reading. No, 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 no. You have a question, Councillor? Just an observation. Thank you, Councillor. I'll check your observation. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've said it before, but uh, this report is a great tool for the councillors to be able to be across what's happening and thank the uh, Chief Executive and his crew for putting it together. Thank you. Councillor Brown, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to our CE, thank you once again for and the staff for um, preparing this for us. I just had a couple of uh, questions. One was um, well, a comment on page 24 about our tourism um, ad, which you can see now on TV, which is very good. But I just didn't. I just wondered if about I think noticed the Kyoto tourism video. It's actually a video rather than still photos, and it's really very engaging. And I just was going to suggest that next time. Um, and we should actually find out who to pet that video next time we're going to do some advertising when our other one gets a bit old. We might look at something similar. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's a very good um, ad for tourism. Uh, so, if that's what I'm talking about, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I'm just wondering about the Yabra State Forest weed control. Is this on the road reserve? Council, please indicate the page. Uh, page 71. Thank you. There's a soda apple, a stock of soda apple outbreak in the Amber State Forest. And apparently there's a number of weed officers going up there to do some rapid control thing. And I'm just wondering, is that in the road reserve or is that actually within the state forest itself? I'm sorry, we have to talk on the road as well. The difference within, yeah, thank you. The difference within the state forest itself, I'm wondering why our forest is called doing um, Rather than, I know there's a $20,000 funding for it, but it's taking weed officers off their other, away from their other duties if it is actually happening within within the confines of the Yarra State Forest, which I do not think is right. Is right. The State Forest, the Forestry Corps can do it themselves. Yeah. The, um, <coughs> I was wondering with our food premises inspections, has any regulatory. Page 75. Thank you. Food premises inspections, has any regulatory action been complied? I can take it on notice. My understanding was that we haven't actually issued any at this point in time. So as I said, I have to go back and read the further. I've got the inspections I wouldn't want to have been completed. Um, but I've gone back and confirm that that's done. Page 59, sorry to jump back. Rural addressing um, says that there's some work to be done there. Uh, and I'd just like to note that I've looked at a couple of the rural addressing uh, points that we were allocated with. And some are up in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near a road. And so I'm wondering how we can, what we can do to fix incorrect, incorrect GPS points. And others, when you see on the road, you have given that, you know, like might be 797 up on the river road. And when you feed that into your maps, it says, not known, but other ones are. Um, so there's just a uh, there's a few issues there, and I just um, I'm happy to provide some of that information. Um, that was page 59. Well, did you wish to see the comment because it sits up the CEs? Yeah. Oh, sorry. But, but there are a few issues in the show. Like there's some some houses, such as that building at Tumbarra, which it doesn't even have a rural address. Yeah. But um, and I know now the Upper Rocky, there's several where it's the rural address number that you give it when you feed it into the, the map thing, the GPS or something. And I'm, I'm sure that that will have a show. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's 
three of our five investors are incorrect. So I'm just, I'm glad to see there's nothing being fixed because if you have a, it's in design for emergency services. So if you do have an emergency service feed in a number and you're out on the, on the road yeah. saying, I'm here, uh, and they say, we can't find it. Yeah. So um, 107, the hygiene contract, just congratulations, it's only $14,000 a year on that. Um, and I'm just wondering with, page 68, it says private road works greater than $100,000 per year grant from RMS. Is that actually private road works we're doing for RMS? Are they treated as being private? And the final one, page 69, weeds. Weeds at the, I'm just wondering about weeds at the dump. Um, there's a heap of, can we, who, who is responsible for slashing the weeds up there? Because there's farmers' fans everywhere that I presume staff have to walk through to get down to those second hand lily bins, and, which I'm sure won't go down really well with the pond police jumps. Um, but it's not a really good look when council is showing weird things for the public. Fair point. Yes, but thanks again for all that. You're always welcome. I was going to say there's probably a little bit of both, so I'll take that one on notice and I'll, I'll talk to the um, the waste guys as well. We'll see when we come there and get something done. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. To do with the seas, are you? Uh, three is the man. Has councils got any questions or need more clarity on page the bottom of page 15's comments, which are under all of that leadership? Councils, please, if, uh, as you all didn't, there's any other questions to do with the board? Councilor McGish, do you have any questions? No. Yeah. Councilor Eric, you have all apologised. Yeah, please. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to share uh, this question. It's about the rule addressing. Yep. Now, with the real address in you, actually GPS the sign. Councillor, just, oh, just up for some clarity for me. So this is marrying into the question from Councillor Peter. Yes, yeah. yeah. Now, that, that's all right for a land-based vehicle, but when they're looking for a house from a, a, the air, it's very difficult to find. I have this situation arise at River Tree, and they're asking me how to find somebody's place. And it's very difficult to explain from uh, over the phone to somebody in the air, how do I actually find that place when they're looking for the GPS uh, signal from the actual road number? And I'm just wondering whether it would be worthwhile to continue that, especially for some of these rural addressings, uh, to actually the house. Colin? Yeah, three years, man. That's an interesting comment from my councillor. I, I, I know down uh, certainly in some of the other Councils, uh, where they're a bit more advanced with rural addressing. Uh, a lot of the councils want that. So you go for a, you go for a drive down the uh, main road near the, near the port. Uh, you'll ever see there's lots of signs everywhere. That, that, and, and that's what, you know, that's, that's, that's really where, as I understand, GPS is done to, to, you know, the point of entry into a property. Because people will be putting their houses anywhere and everywhere, and they can change over time as well. You go and build a new house. So what are we going to do? Go and change the rural addressing? So I think it's maybe that's something you just need to clarify. There would only be a few areas in the Shire where, you, where we do need a helicopter to get to a house. I presume in an emergency there wouldn't be too many. So I'm just wondering how we can do something to uh, speed up the situation where we need emergency services per area. I, I, in talking to the officer who looks after this area, this is a matter of project, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. we, we, we've been getting data back from the land and property, which uh, you know, they're supposed to be helping us on it, but that, that data is, is, is often wrong. Uh, and you know, from what I'm told, this, this project itself, in updating rural addressing, could well be you know, a two month full time job of going and checking all of the addresses, going and checking the coordinates getting back in contact with our guy. Um, you know, we've even had issues with, um, you know, you, you, you go off of uh, land and property information in terms of boundaries, cadastro boundaries, right, property boundaries, and 
you know, because we have inquiries from the, the community, uh, the Tom Tom, you know, my brother's on the road reserve or my gate, you know, is that something I have to be talking to you about, you know, or because it's a property boundary game, or is this in my property? And, and, and we, we've had issues all the time. We've got the election back saying, oh, the cadaster's out by 20 metres or something like that. So it's it's an ongoing issue, and I'm not so sure that it's a quick fix council, but um, certainly when we get to it, when we apply the resources to it, um, we certainly ask those questions, you know, do, do we, should we be sticking with the form just providing, um, you know, a, a <coughs> location to, as, as an interest to a property because there's got to be there's got to be an interest to every property. At the end of the day, you know, we, we, we don't facilitate land on the properties, um, and so wherever that entrance point is, you know, adjacent to a road somewhere, that's where the real addressing should be, and there should be some sort of track there after that's visible uh, taken to the to the home. More questions to our well, before we do, is it to do help our CEs? Any questions to do with page 15 for the brief for them? Councillor Pepper, are you referring to page 15? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if the CE would care to elaborate on uh, Three, Mr. Mayor, I'd be delighted to elaborate on it. Um, that is my uh, <laughs> Mr. Peter Murphy uh, gave a speech this morning. Uh, he's one of the long uh, Congo line of people that uh, we love council to drop everything they're doing in the current operational plan delivery plan and get on the, the bandwagon and what he'd like to uh, see within the community. Yeah, well, just stop the, the, saying you yeah, fully support his comments there. That's a very good, a very, very good, with respect to pay, that's a very good example. So we all understand how this thing works. Sorry. And um, I, for one, and supportive of whoever comes to the community for tourism, the more the merrier. As a matter of fact, I want to spend 10 times more money on everything, including uh, tourism, roads, anything I can think of. And I've said that to the mayor on numerous occasions that I'd love to pay the place in gold from head to uh, top to bottom. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, there's, six dot four, or there's six points there um, that are very relevant. But the last one is councils required to report at the end of the four year term what has been achieved as part of the four year delivery plan and the four ones by one annual operating plans, which are known as the operating plans, the percentage of what we've completed. Um, so what happens at the end of the four years, there's a, a term report, and the public will uh, look at the percentage of uh, things that are, are delivered, and if it's less than or watered down from what uh, their expectations are, um, that will detract from not only the sense of confidence of the whole community, but councillors and staff as well. So um, uh, it's certainly council's prerogative uh, and also the administration's arm, arm's requirement to adjust things as they go along. One bad storm or one windstorm or one fire and the whole yep. shooting match completely changes. Um, but where possible, uh, it's cheaper and we get more things done if we stick to the plan. And um, uh, this isn't as big a problem here as, uh, as I've seen in past lives. Um, but the reason the Integrated Planning and Reporting Act was brought in in 2009 was to, number one, ensure councils were more sustainable with their asset management and their workforce planning, but number two, to uh, particularly inner city councils that were pretty uh, bad uh, at it, was to try and encourage councillors to go to the community, ask the community what they want, uh, advertise it, put it in a four-year plan, and then deliver it. Not change it every time there was um, a new thing on a, a new kid on the block. So um, I'm fully supportive of, of uh, Mr. Murphy um, and the half a dozen other people that I've seen in the last six months come in with ideas. And I've used an example there um, as the Archery Club, which didn't exist a couple of years ago. And um, in a very short period of time, through the hard work of, and it's one of our councillors, but uh, other people as well, because um, Council Raven does do it on his own, um, have turned something from nothing into something. Um, and uh, they have been very humble uh, in what they've um, uh, sought and their way they've gone about it. Um, and it's very important that Council understand, which I think they do, that 
that everything that we add to the list, either money's got to come off something else, or the amount of effort spent on those other things are watered down. And my, my biggest risk is, is that we're doing a, 101 things a tiny little bit instead of 10 things a lot. And that will give the impression to the public that nothing's getting done because staff are trying to spread their um, time too thin, particularly with tourism, when we've only got one tourism person. And um, an economic development, we've got one, one of them as well. So, um, uh, as I said, it does everything from uh, heritage cars to birds uh, to archery, uh, climbing ball rock. Doesn't make any difference where the money walks into the community from, it's all good, but we've just got to keep that in mind. And thank, and thank you for, for raising that. Uh, Mr. So it's very important that we're understanding of that and how those good things can change our, our long term direction. So you've explained it really well. Councillor Crawford, just invited. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Jerry. And it might be worth re remembering that um, Councillor is a very supportive of Archie to the tune of leasing of that uh, not being considerable size of land for only $10 a year. And it's good to see that that $10 a year is now. Yep. Expanded into being um, into being the national competition um, with the birds and the environment flow. Where we're talking about, it's difficult, but some of the teams are actually low at the moment, and we are there. Um, however, I'm sure there's other ways we can support in our tourism brochures and websites, etc., about promoting Tenfold as a bird um, watching destination, and it is certainly. Um, between the mountain rock and the two big growth uh, parts of um, tourism. And the other interesting thing was um, I noticed in the report that there are people, um, well, not sorry, this report, um, the Parks and Garden one, people requesting a tree list of what was in Tenerfield, and the comment was, well, we already have one in the business centre. So it's interesting that people are asking for something that is actually already in existence. And maybe we might be able to do a, a better list or, or even a map place, a, a, a map with, um, sure. with stuff. But um, so people sometimes request things that are actually already there. So we may need to promote that tree list a little bit better. But things like that, that yeah. we can have the foundations on that we can, we can um, improve on. Thank you, Councillor. Questions to them, so each of the other report councillors. Uh, all happy to receive a note. On file, Councillor McNeish. You're fine for a good sleep at night. All in favour. Against? Carried. All good. Moving to page 24, councillors. It's item GOB 48 slash 18. See uh, Northern Rivers Regional Organisation of Councils for their invitation. Don't move in a second to deal with this item, please. Councillor Brian Murray, move and thank you. Second, Councillor Berry, and thank you. And a hand over to our uh, Chief of uh, Corporate Office to present this one. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think I'll, I'll take the report as read. I'm happy to take any questions or, or comments from Councillors. Councillors, any questions, comments to the right? Councillor Berry? I so would have to have a member, not a member, a affiliate member on that board. It would it, be um, the, the, just the mayor. No, the mayor and the CEO would attend. Yeah. So, and, and fully, fully this is going to be a this was invitation, Councillors. Councillors, I'll give you the history of this while we're in Canberra the other day. The Mayor of Kyogle, who's the, who's the chair of their, their rock, Law Rock, which, yes, this council has, has had, had association with, but only because in the previous council there was not, nothing happening out this way at all. So we felt that we needed to uh, to join someone, and yes, they did vote Kyogle, which did vote not to accept us, and that's why we were a non voting member. They have now off the invitation if we wanted to continue as a non voting member in that organisation. And I asked the uh, CEO over well, there to be in a business paper. It's totally a, 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 um, a decision of this council because we've, we've uh, fully supported of the newly formed New England um, JO, which is called NIGA. And um, it's a wonderful meeting out there in Monday, and I can see good things in, in the, there, in my opinion. So, totally a decision of the council. And the, the recommendations there, councillors. Anyway, the only comment I said to when we once again to see and I yesterday to share with you, councillors had a lengthy one on this one. Um, right, but you know, it's whoever would be a mayor or, or money speaking on my behalf, but 
I don't like to have meetings when you have got a say or a vote, but be fully aware to not voting. We're just there to, to hear what's going on. Is it good for us to find out because more than 30 of our shy is built groups? Of course it is. So that's a problem. So I'll just lay it there, that's all. Don't worry, mate. One, one way or the other. Councillor Bromwin. Uh, yeah, no, I support that because I think, as you're saying, um, you know, we won't, uh, we refuse things. We, um, it's very important because we are part of that yeah. watershed and what happens over the other coast has a Big huge point. potential to affect us. So, unless you're in the room hearing what's happening, um, you know, you can't vote. It's very But be aware, councillors, and, and I need to share this with you, with my argument against this album, it's still be the same. That they work on a consensus. It's, if it isn't unanimous, it doesn't get up. That's with Norwood, that's with Norwood. They haven't changed. Um, whether I agree or not, well, that's just my personal view. We definitely don't do it out here. And that's that's in the constitution of the newly formed organisation. And I can share with you that was the, the vote the other day with Narrabah joined. There's six member councils, two voted against, four did. They're in. That's how it should be. We're democratic. But it's not, don't happen like that down this side. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Anyway. Okay, for recommendations then, more questions, Councillor? Councillor McNish, yes? I'm going to say something today. <laughs> yeah, you better be quiet. Very quiet. Okay. I just can't see the point. If you can't vote, there's no point in the vote. Oh, and let's be quiet, Councillor. Yes. Um, unless you know, we do go as non-voting, it may well lead to voting at some stage. Um, be aware, if that did happen, there'd be a financial cost to this Council yeah. to be a member of that. Look, we can say that, see it. Uh, right, no, no, you're good. Councillor McNish has is, is, is agreed with my comment to do with the non-voting and why would we, we be there, but I've just indicated if we did become a voting member, there would be a financial cost over the top of this council. Uh, through Mr Mayor, we're not allowed under the uh, Joint Organisation uh, Act under the provisions that have just uh, been amended in the Local Government Act, the JROs, um, we're prescribed by the Government to be a part of uh, the Northern Inland uh, plan, Planning uh, Area, which basically goes from Liverpool Plains uh, out to Moree across to us. Um, so, uh, as the Council's aware, we're in the New England uh, Joint Organisation. Um, there's a Nemoy uh, Joint Organisation which fit uh, within that planning zone. We're uh, not allowed underneath, or, or, uh, yeah, we're not allowed to be members of two, but we're we were told, as were the other 11 councils in that area, you must form uh, a JO um, with more than uh, uh, two councils within that prescribed zone. Well, we are told to, to so I asked the question out there the other day, Councillor McNish, to uh, be there as an organic member, as an associate. Councillor Griffin. Question is fine. Mr Mayor, I'd be extremely disappointed our mayor could not sway somebody to vote in our favour. <laughs> so, and given that close association, all the things we've got going with Coyote, yeah. well, I think it's important that we are there. Yeah, fair comment. I go, Council, for a close debate for questions. Dogs' recommendations there. All that one favour the recommendation. Yes? Okay. Council, move on to page 26. Uh, it's item GOB 49 slash 18. Council Expense Facility Policy. I'm going to move to the second one, please. Councillor Brian Murray, thank you. Second to Councillor Mike Petrick, well, thank you. And um, I'll hand over to our Chief Corporate Officer for service. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. I'll hand over to Eric in a moment. But as you know, we've, we've had a, a few discussions about the Council Expenses and Facilities Policy, and it seemed like a, an appropriate time when considering the remuneration of Mr Six Pay Cut as well to actually go through and, and look at both and get some conjunction. At this point in time, we have asked um, for some feedback and, and haven't really received a great deal to make changes um, to that particular policy. But I'll hand over to, to Erica now to give you a, a better introduction. Well, I apologise, Erica. Welcome as always. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the report provided is uh, to present the amended council expenses and facilities policy to council for adoption. The um, draft policy has been provided to councillors in March this year at the councillor workshop, um, and so we have not received any feedback from the councillor group at this point in time. Uh, we would propose, as recommended here, that we actually place the document now on public display 
that still allows another 28 day period for councillors and all the public to provide submission. Uh, and then again, if there are no such submission, that the policy be adopted. Questions, councillors? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, um, uh, there was a question about uh, the definition of undertaking a physical business in 6.2 of the policy in relation to private vehicle uh, uh, usage. Um, uh, yeah, through Councillor Murray, um, at the moment it says um, includes reimbursement for public transport fees. Um, Use a private vehicle or, or, or a high car, parking costs, uh, tolls, cap charge, and documented uh, ride share programs. And uh, I might like um, ask Councillor Murray to uh, ex uh, to expand on his question. Councillor Murray, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, my question is: well, the request was, and this has been going on quite some time, yes. that I claim. Mileage fees to come down once a month to pick up my agenda. Right. And now the option out of that was the council could pay me travelling mileage or council can deliver the papers to me. Right. So it's optional. I, I, mean, I don't know which way you go. Did you want to comment, Mr. Sayer? Yes. And uh, the question uh, was whether or not. Um, the electronic uh, versions or whether or not the, the uh, hard copy versions uh, how our council would um, uh, determine that because it's uh, purely up to council, it's a council expense, uh, council is an expense. Um, so there's to it. Uh, some people, uh, including myself, uh, and I, I must change, uh, prefer uh, paper copies. Um, and other people uh, prefer electronic uh, copies. Uh, as it gets down to, um, I suspect, uh, uh, age and um, uh, technical proficiency and convenience. Uh, Councillor Murray uh, obviously prefers uh, paper copies. And uh, the question is um, whether or not the Motor vehicle use for Council Murray to pick up the business paper from here will be classified as official business. Do we need to make a decision on this? Well, I'm interested in the council. Council, I just need to, as you read on there, um, and a question to you too, Mark, is to say that, that on 6.4, which, which relates to what you're saying, Council. Council is seeking to be reimbursed for use of private vehicles, right? Stop there. That's what you, you're seeking. Right? Must keep a log book according to date, distance, and purpose of travel, but in claim copies of relevant log book contained must be provided to the claim. Uh, Mr. C, is that, is that um, sufficient for what we do on that claim for stating the date of our use of our vehicle, what it was for, how far we travel? Is that sufficient? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, mostly yes, because if a council has got a fixed dress, unless the house is in a caravan moving around the shire, it's going to be the same distance every time uh, to or from the, the place. So, yeah. so um, yeah, it, it's a little bit academic, really. But um, uh, so, um, uh, for, for example, um, unless someone has changed address, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to uh, to determine uh, the distances these days, um, and. I don't think that's the issue. The issue is um, Councillor Murray, uh, whether or not um, uh, it's construed that um, because an electronic uh, copy is supplied to all councils, whether or not it's official business to pick up a non-electronic non copy, meaning a paper copy of the business paper, and I'll leave it up to council to decide. Yes, with myself, and purely my view, but not as many as a council, um, you know, uh, C has raised a very good point there that we have got two versions. One is the left, and although I don't use my laptop to do chair this week, uh, I only my personal view that I like to have a hard copy. So I pick mine up and, and even as a council, people say, Would that put in the couple of councils on the council very obviously you're outside council and council players? How do you pick up your version? 
put me up electronically, but it's quite difficult because now when you get the agenda, right? And you're looking through the attachment. You've got to track the agenda, you've got to try and find the attachment. So I'm going to, in the future, I'm going to have to get the attachment into the hard copy. Catherine? Well, I prefer the iPad, but this month, I could not open any, I could not fully open any of the attachments. They go so far and stop, so I had to get a heap of uh, waste paper. Did you receive the big prize? No, I was down on Monday. Did you make a special trip? Yes. If I didn't, uh, if I wasn't coming out Monday, I would have had to, or I'll ask Carmen to see if one of the blokes was coming out that way. So. Casper, did you show it outside Casper? Oh, I just. Wait, I'll stop you. Councillor I need to yeah. get a consensus here. I mean, we're trying to work with this. I, I, I go through town probably once a day yeah. between the properties and like a small in the way through. Yeah. Just on it, Mr. Mayor, originally I, I was just trying to find it out, I just couldn't, but it was very specific about what you could pay yeah. up the mileage for. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I go back to right when I was first on council, and I actually had a tabulum one week and drank the next. Now I've got to pay the other drink because of the progress with this. I didn't get money out of the of course, it was a um, Chamber of Commerce meeting or whatever. Okay. So it, just, it had to actually be a progress meeting yep. or a council approved yep. committee, and that was very specific. Yep. I presume it was still not scrapped to go through it. Oh, I would well, say it is, Gav, yeah. yeah. it needs to be made. I think it's that we have enough by like, broad, it's the first thing it's going to happen. I mean, it's like a time coming in and saying, but this is a paper I'm going to have to feed cattle. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't do such a thing. No, no, no. This is making a bit of a. Not mockery of it, but yeah, like you, you could use it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's needed. Council, with respect, Council, wrong Peter, you can try to horse him from town, so I haven't got it. You're a state. And the town, he's well, hopefully the same. Council, Peter, did you have some comment? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Manners. One of the councils that you remember, I think you were on the council, he, he left uh, the Tenerife side, moved out of the valley. Shot. And as, soon as, you, as soon as you came back into the Tenerfield shot, we got paid the mileage. I mean, before my time, I do remember that. Created a big controversy at the time. Anyway, councillors, to move on, we need to. I'm oh, sorry, Bob, councillor. Yeah. Yes, I used to get the uh, thing on the table all the time before. Uh, I was in the PDF thing for my could switch it over. From one to the other, a lot easier. Get the uh, get these attachments now, you've got to switch it all off. And you can't sort of find it, it doesn't come up real quick on it. The other way that used to come up was a lot better and a lot quicker. You could just turn it off and go over to the, your attachments and you could look at that and, and you could go back to where you were. But this hub system just doesn't seem to doesn't work half as good as the other system. I will bring the meeting back to what we're dealing with. Once again, Councillor Murray, please respect. I need to ask you, so Councillor Murray, at the moment, as we sit today, you're not getting paid for coming out and picking up your business paper? No. And, and, you, and you wish to? No, I do. Just okay. Like so I'm going to ask you, boss, here, Mr. Z, because we're, we're dealing with a recommendation that we adopt the amended council expense and a silver seat policy pending the 28 public exhibition period and receive the payment of, of expenses and permission facilities to council policy pending the conclusion of the 28 day. Public exhibition council expenses facilities. Where do we approve or, or make a decision on? Sorry, on Councillor Murray's request. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. By the same token, I'm happy enough for Councillor to deliver to deliver my paper. Right. I don't particularly want to be paid as such. Yep. I'm going to crush it to size. Yep. Well, all, all I'm saying, and once again, it's a meeting process, and I'm asking for a bit of advice here. Am I asking for a vote on this from the councillors? I mean, is that appropriate that we, we're going to approve that Councillor Murray gets, gets reimbursed for his travelling down to pick up his business paper? Or, or does Councillor Blue? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, recommendation is that the draft policy be put on public yes. display. This can then be discussed in further detail. The, the actual draft policy is set out by um, a policy guidance document that was also provided at the workshop from the Office of Local Government. Now, it did not provide a definition of what forms official business specifically in that document. However, further information can be provided 
to the councillors for discussion in July, and then still within the 28 days submission period, where you can then define under Tenerfield Shire Council's requirements what is deemed to be official business, and you can actually then identify as a councillor group what is official business and reimbursable and what is not. And certainly then guidance, further guidance from the Office of Local Government, as well as guidance from um, conditions of employment for Tenfield Shire Council, which also set parameters for councillors' reimbursements as well. So there's the 28 day period, and so that's what the recommendation is to put this paper on public exhibition, yep. but also so that you have this further opportunity to define the policy that you wish to have adopted. Okay. And that's, that's a thank you, Ricky, for that. Also, Councillor Bob, I'll go to, to uh, Kylie for some comment. The only other comment, I guess, in support of what Eric is saying is should you wish to actually define official business, you may, and Council may choose to define that in line with anything that is approved or adopted by the resolution of Council, which would include your committees, etc., including, say, one trip per calendar month to um, the Chetterfield Shire Council offices for the purpose of conducting business and then that could well be up to each individual council, whether that's a meeting with the, the CE, yep. you know, for a specific Good purpose point. or to pick up a business plan, those kind of things. So there's the opportunity, I guess, to expand that definition how you wish, but as I said, make sure that it, it sort of makes your, your needs of yep. two parts to that. And thank you, Colin, for those very good comments and, uh, and uh, good advice. Councillor Bromley, you had a question or comment? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, even though one lives on a skipping job from Tara. <laughs> I actually did this week come in specifically to pick up my papers. Okay, now I used to first just use the iPad. Yep. But um, with that little click between the two. But the other thing is when one asks questions about things, I now highlight through yeah. the document, yeah. which is a lot easier to do than to be trying to yeah. click through this and this and then speak to it. That's right, yeah. And etc. And particularly so with the monthly report. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to set it into things highlighted. So, uh, it, it, and we are supposed to make, in support of Council Murray, we are supposed to make informed decisions. Yes. Now, what happens if a councillor in the future has no internet service? How do they access their stuff? We're just lucky some of us are on the edge of it. Yep. Um, is there any opportunity with Council Murray to mail, like the documents come out on Thursday, to get them into the mail on Friday, so he gets a mail is not allowable because you would have to go to Tamworth first, then come back. Yeah. Well, we so they probably would have to the post office. Yes. <laughs> no, well, I just thought I, I, yeah. 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 I didn't play, did not get a mail service. Yeah. So I still have to come to oh, the okay. yeah. I'll, just, I'll just bring this to, to a head because Erica, thank you. You have explained it very clearly, and, and, and so has Kylie, that, uh, that in this, uh, which I would like to say that in this next 28 day period, that, when we come back and make a decision of what we determine as a council, we don't have to be like you want as a, as official business. So if everyone's still live and running on Council Murray has been an issue with you for some time, I'm pleased yes. to say that. And I do I do uh, uh, commend you on talking to the CE about it and the best way forward. And as a council I think that that, that um, you respect the decision that's made at a later date. If everybody's happy with that. Yes. That one. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Well, if I could, um, yeah, so. Mr. Mayor, I could add to that. <laughs> the reason I don't like coming into town, I said, because of the hazardous roads. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can see some improvement. I drive a truck rather than my car. Right. On. Okay, councillors. But anyway, but Eric, once again, thank you for your, your uh, advice there and explaining that clearly what we need to do. So, uh, Council, will put up the, the recommendation. So, I can't answer to what happens if the Council has no internet service with an item. How do they get the same? Uh, Mr. Mayor, that question and Council Murray, Murray's question, I put to Council that um, we've got uh, four weeks now um, that Chloe uh, and her team can um, draft up some, some words, um, uh, distribute them to, to councillors for, for their advice, and then we'll bring something back more formally to, to the next meeting, such that we can just insert them and lock it up and bear on. Thank you, Mr. C, for your comments there. Okay, councillor, the uh, officer's recommendations, everyone's favour to adopt. 
against it, carried. Thank you. Councillor Moody, on the phase 28 before I do, councillors, we have phase 28 at half past 12. It will be here. Do you want to continue on? It's, it's currently, so we can read it. No, well, that's, that's up to you. I, I was just bored telling you. So we'll just charge on to an eye. So we'll go on to page uh, 28, councillors, in your hard copy, for those who have hard copies. Item COB 50 slash 18, and we'll remove the right action for councillors. And we'll the association back. And the Mayor to 18 to 19. If I move a second to deal with this item, please. Councillor Tom Peters, thank you. Second by Councillor Gary Berry. I thank you, and I'll just stop there so Nolene and that's where I can catch up. Okay. So, so councillors, you um, you're happy we do this we do this item then break for lunch? Okay. So we have a movement for this item for item G A B fifty slash eighteen nine. It's been moved by Councillor Tom Peters, second by Councillor Gary Berry. Okay, I'm going to hand over to OCE to present this item, please. Can I ask you, Mr. Mayor, um, is there anything else to add? It's pretty straightforward. Um, um, Council uh, has to uh, abide by the Music Files Government Remuneration Tribunal uh, each year. Uh, they report on it, and each year, uh, every Council in Music Files uh, then gets the uh, option of deciding what they uh, wish to. Uh, to do in relation to that recommendation from the remuneration um, tribunal. Councillors, the report's there in front of you. Any questions to the CD to do with the report? No? The recommendation's there, councillors. All happy to, to that to report on the favour. Against? Carol. <coughs> councillors, can I ask for a motion uh, to suspend standing orders, please? Councillor Bert Sawyer, thank you. Second by Councillor Brian Murray, and we'll break for lunch. Okay, councillors, we'll bring that meeting back to the board and, and as always, thank you all very much for sharing a lovely lunch and uh, with the senior staff, so it's good. Can I have a motion, please, to resume the awards? Yeah. Councillor Berry, thank you. Is the mover and second of Councillor Tom Peters is the seconder. And I think you all in favour. Okay. Now, Councillors, in your hard copy, move, move on to page 31. It's item GOV 51 slash OD, local government New South Wales election and annual conference. Uh, 21st and 23rd of October, 218. Can I move the second of the other side, please? Councillor Murray, thank you. Second of my Councillor Sawyer, and I thank you. And I'll hand over to the CEO to present the, this part of the report. Uh, really, Mr. Mayor, unless there's any questions, the uh, uh, report is as, as presented. Thank you. Questions, Councillors? Councillor Brown? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, we had a previous meeting. Councillor McNish um, said it would be good for. <laughs> For the councillors to attend yeah. um, the annual conference. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, I'm speaking with Phyllis Miller, who's, who um, was from Falls County, she said, yes, it's a great networking yeah. occasion. And they have, I think, six or seven of their councillors in March. So I was just wondering, are we looking at, in addition to the mayor and the CEO, of any councillors who are not present just to, to go? Do you wish it to be paid? Quite time. Uh, it's not like in the year, but I mean, you know, people decide. I think it's appropriate that, that, that it be discussed here, but it's council size that one, or, or if it's in our budget, I'm going to mean that, to go, that, that's fine. I, I do think that it's healthy for, for uh, other councillors. Usually, I've been there in my time at the time as deputy mayor to the uh, annual conference in New South Wales, and uh, much of you're about experience. So, the council wishes to move along those lines. If the opportunity is now, I think would have been great to see. I'll leave that for council. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to do. Would it just be the, the, the money suggestion, the deputy mayor, or whatever? Whatever you want to do. One. And, and with respect, it needs to be something so, because obviously, as you go down with their financial and the in a way that there's a financial you know, um, tag with this. So. It needs to be worked out so it's a room to be booked and accommodation organised. You're looking about two grand ahead. I guess, Mr. Mayor, it will depend on how much money is left in the council uh, education budget. Yeah. Yeah. The wording is. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <coughs> well, at first place, it's a bit from Valley. It used to take the whole council down every year. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, several other councils took three or four councils. Yeah. And, uh, like I said, I've said several times, it's definitely the mayor herself. And, uh, 
obviously invaluable experience. But I'll share this with the with the with the, with the meeting. Be fully aware that bigger councillors get more delegates, voting delegates also. Now I'm not I know you're aware of that. Yeah, I'm not going to make the old shots. Yeah. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, but that wouldn't have changed much because I know that the loss of costs are, they get, they get uh, more, because they're bigger, obviously, it's yeah. more to do with your population. Yeah. And you get more uh, more delegates. Yeah. But obviously, when we get a documentation, and, and there's a column there, which is how many voting delegates you get. Yeah. And I, I always read that with interest. Yeah. When I was in Australia, there was only one voting delegate per council. Okay. Which was well, that, that's not. Yeah. I mean, I'm going back probably six or seven years. Whether they take, oh, well, for example, to support what you said, wider red camera, and they had, oh, maybe I won't say all of them, but I'm going to say six at, at, at the, uh, at the uh, conference of camera. Yeah. Do we know where they're going to be next year and year after? This one's a good one. Aubrey, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Yeah. So I was just thinking that um, because of cost, if we knew where they were coming up the next couple of years, like it was said that it would be helpful in the term of the council to at least attend one, yeah. one conference. Fully support. Um, whether it happened to be this one because of the logistics of getting there or the cost, or whether if next year it's one way of the power could go with several councillors. What we did, councillor, uh, with to support what you've just said, uh, a few years ago when the, um, excuse me, the Rose Conference was at Tamworth, and the, um, the um, state conference was at Coffs Harbour. Uh, council was indicated which ones they wanted to go to, and half the council went to the Rose Conference, the other half the, the indicated to, to the uh, conference in Coffs Harbour. Anyway, if I can just flag it for uh, a discussion for another council meeting, yeah. maybe. So we have to make sure that that decision uh, is made prior to the close off date for the early bird registration, which is usually for one of those tickets. That's a good point. So there we go. If you want to make a, a, a um, another dot point to do with this, with the officer's recommendation, quite a time to. But otherwise, uh, to support SE's comments, um, if it went to next month, we might be getting close to the Y. Do, do you know what they do? Well, it'll be, it'll be July. Yeah. Okay. And I would think, uh, as an example, and the councillors, yeah, um, that if you uh, if you indicated through um, SE and then another one, that yes, you would, and uh, for that money to um, expand on the money we spend, it could have to be a council resolution. Uh, you know, we could have to. I'm not being negative. Just how it all works. We could have to have a extraordinary meeting to approve it. So that's how important it is. Uh, fully supported. Some of the early bird registration fight. I'm wanting to keep the profits. You're wanting to keep the what? No, they're wanting to keep the profits. It's $900 a piece. It's very expensive to have a conference. Yeah. Yeah. Are, they, are they important to attend course they are? Because, uh, you know, yeah. you know yeah. sort of know what the sports and networking, yeah. and, uh, especially, you know, like a camera, I'll give you a camera. I don't know, but people, we're close to the most money, I see. And uh, we spoke to the, the uh, to David, to the president of the uh, Alpha, and uh, <coughs> he agreed with that. I think Began might have been sort of up there with us, but it's, it's credit to this council that, that we have those four motions and, and all all get up. And a couple with debate, and one with an amendment. But anyway, we got there. So, so if that's even this conference, would it be pushing your way to the thingy? Is that one of their motions? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, we won't need to by that stage because we'll know whether or not we've got um, the dollar for dollar funding by, from uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency by that stage. And we'll know probably within about a month whether the um, 11 other councils in the Northern Inland Regional Waste Group are supportive of it, um, which I think they will be. 
forgive me, uh, does that, does that mean they're in theory they're supporting you or financially? Um, through Mr. May, uh, yesterday uh, council wrote to all members of the Northern Inland Regional Waste Group, uh, and today we'll be writing to five other councils uh, and uh, Regional Development Australia, asking those councils to pledge amount of $15,000 each uh, to go into uh, the local government's 50% uh, dollar-for-dollar -dollar contribution in, in the form of the grant application to the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, the, normal, um, the, the normal way it happens is that, um, uh, and it's called a ring, I don't know where they, they get the N from, because um, their, their name's Arena. Arena normally go dollar for dollar, and they normally look for um, um, multiple uh, levels of collaboration, which is why councils try to get as many different people to support uh, council as possible, even different states. Um, so that will be over within about five weeks, which will be well before um, that conference. To support SA, the council we are getting a little bit away from what we're dealing with, but uh, Councillor Rogan and I are travelling to Canada tomorrow to uh, help celebrate the, uh, the Northern Land Waste Group with their 20 year anniversary. And um, the president, the chairperson, uh, Councillor Big Pierce, and Mary Urali will be sending uh, the paper on that at the meeting asking for support. So in principle, you've asked a very good question. Uh, the um, support we've received in principle from all the organisations, and I see it's been invited to uh, present in August at the Country Mayors. Uh, that's basically what's out across the board. And the, with the JO has been a bit, which is in this correspondence later on, uh, and you hearing the JO has been a bit better than that. Yeah. That's pretty very good. Well, should we, should we, I don't know how one feels about it. Should we um, approve, in addition, one one additional body yeah. to go down? Can I suggest the deputy mayor or or one other? Yeah. Yeah. If the deputy mayor can't go, there'll be another council. We may not be deputy mayor at that stage either. But anyway, but certainly um, another council. Yeah, you can just put there that same number. Yeah, deputy mayor or or another council. Yeah. One additional yeah. deputy. Yeah. 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 Just that one because yeah. the board would be the other end of the, no the state. If everyone thinks that's appropriate. As, as point four, or is it an amendment? Mr. C. Amendment? Okay. It's an amendment. Amendment point four. Yep. Um, oh, no, it's amendment to one to be through the attendance of the mayor, chief executive, and one. Okay. One additional. Yep. I accept that. Yep. Yeah. Amendment to number one. That's where it sits. Yeah, fifty tenths of the mayor, yep. comma, chief executive, and one additional council. You know what the deputy Well, it could be the deputy mayor. Well, she? No, no, no. That must be a big group. It's going to be a big group. Well, being private. Yeah, I mean, it's... No, not at all. No, I don't take well. Well, you know, I don't think you should. No, I just think you've already had. No, look, council's full, so I'm going to say yes, I want to go. Yes. Well, just the way I said, I mean, it would appropriate that the deputy mayor would, would be the other target, yeah. but in, in the case where the deputy mayor wasn't available, that should be covered also, and I think what you're doing will cover that. Okay. Sorry, no. So the deputy mayor and, and, and approve the attendance of the mayor, chief executive, and yeah. deputy mayor or additional council. Is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. Okay, councillor, there's your members. It's been moved by councillor Brown, Petrie, seconded by councillor Greg Sawyer. Councillor Petrie, with respect. Councillor Petrie, with respect. It's and deputy mayor or additional council. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And um, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the cash book balances uh, listed there in the report uh, 2.497 million in the general fund and 321,000 in the trust fund as of the 31st of May. Uh, I just made a the note there that there was a timing variation with one of our, some of our investments. Uh, so there's an additional $5 million that's invested that's not reflected in that report at the moment, just due to the timing when we took money out of the bank and we for these investments. So uh, I just made a note of that there for you. So um, currently there's uh, 16.3 million in the pack, really, as I said, it was made that was invested at that time. So um, uh, really that's the extent of the report. Questions to uh, to uh, our finance manager to do the report, councillors. No questions. The recommendations there to receive a note. All in favour? Against? Carried. Councillors, move on page thirty-seven. In your hard copy, item GOB fifty-three slash eighteen. Capital expenditure report as of thirty-first May two eighteen. Once again, can I ask for a move and a second, in here, please? Councillor Brian Murray, thank you. Second, please, Councillor White, Petri, thank you. And I'll hand it over to our finance manager again. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Mayor. This report just shows the uh, capital expenditure and we've been helping to tracking as at the 31st of May. Uh, we've been through an updated item as per the quarterly budget review, just as of May. Made some comments there as to the status of the uh, different projects. Uh, Happy to take any questions. Questions to our finance manager, Councillors? Just one, and it's, I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Brown. I don't even go first, but I'm going to. And purely a, a, a question of interest, I mean, any white councillors, but before I ask the question, I do commend, and we are very lucky to, to have the information that's provided to us through all our departments, and, uh, and, and I'll throw yours into that. On page uh, 40, and I had the, the, the conversation with our CEO, and I said to ask you that you were born, under the transport network, we're fixing the country roads and Waterloo Creek Bridge. There's 184,000, obviously, that, that was in the current budget. Uh, the year to date job is 130,000 being spent there, yes. If the, if, is that, and I'll throw onto this, is, it, is the, the project completed and, what, and where does the balance of that money go? Yeah, no, two questions, sorry. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, balance, the project is complete. Yep. There's no more work to be done. Yep. And the balance of that money. Um, is, is there potentially to be used. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind that at this point in time, um, bridges like anything else, yes, right, that's been subsidised a certain amount by the general fund. Yep. Right? And bear in mind that that project, the Wallaby Creek project, went way over oh, budget. Well, okay, so yeah. the fact that it's uh, you know, 54,000 underneath what was currently budgeted there, that's just helpful to follow the moment. Yeah. And, and the other thing, and Paul, you'll be able to use this, I'll go to Ken, come in. Does it go back into the transport network or does it go back into a general fund? Uh, so you, Mr. Mayor, back to the, back to the general fund. Yep. And, uh, yes. Thank you. Question, Councillor Brown, to do the report? Always. <laughs> Just take so much time now. That's good. Um, I had a, um, Asset managers, just a couple of things that can sort of be heard. One was the consulting fees for the development of the master plan for the memorial pool. I was just wondering why that is cancelled and deferred because I thought we didn't have that consulting fee. And the other one was the works depot resurfacing on access and hard stand areas, including drainage. Is it just that wasn't actually cancelled, was it? Is that just a deferred spend? So, just with regard to the sweet block from our that one, we are. Um, Came to the determination that we wouldn't get the works completed in the year that we started, and so that when you look at the operations plan is actually seen. So, whilst we don't recognise it as a carry forward, it's allocated further into the future with a long term financial plan for that one. So, it's still a project that we intend to do, we just wouldn't have started it in order to make the criteria for this particular year. Same with the hard stand. Hard stand, I couldn't tell you about. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, did you want to go forward? Work as a team, come on through. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, the still there, it's been preferred, it's not yeah. uh, But uh, I can take that on my own and double check that for you if you want. 
Yeah, Kenneth Brian Murray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a question that's nearly indirect. With the library service and state government has cut funding, how are we going to take that up? What's happening? Well, very good question. Well, how are we going to take up the slack? Well, on the, on the larger scale council, and, and uh, thank you for your question, uh, through the um, New South Wales local government, and, and there's a report there from council and the also. But to do with that news, it's just come out of the budget in the disappointment that the uh, funding has been cut big time. Uh, as uh, mayor, I'll be supporting the local government in New South Wales and anything we can do as an organisation to uh, to correct that and uh, and um, continue on with the funding at least to where it was. So there is a bit of a, a, a groundswell there at the moment because um, in any correspondence I've received since the budget was announced, uh, very disappointed, but especially due to the cut in library services. But that's that's on a large scale. But you know, you're talking about here at the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, as, as you're probably aware, library funding has been uh, reducing over time. Yeah. And um, yeah, we'll have to uh, have a look at how we can uh, what we can do in terms of our budget. Uh, and so uh, we'll be looking at that between now. And Yes. And, and I will be, uh, to Andrew, when I start, I was the same, Councillor Murray, be um, having those conversations with a local member, because that respect everything starts with a local member, and, uh, and to uh, make him aware that uh, this council's not happy with the reduction in the state budget to libraries. Well, the timing may be, sorry, the timing may be, may be very well uh, correct in as much as the election's coming up. Yes. So, who knows, it might follow. Yes, but, but yeah, to support what you're saying, of course, that's how it works. And they get it across the board from, from a collaboration of, of councils or collaboration from an organisation, well, they need to take note. Councils, any other questions to our finance minister to do this report? If not, happy to put the report to receive a note on favour. Against Carrie, thank you. Councils, move on to page 43 in your heart. Well, it's the, um, thank you, Paul. It's the uh, two reports from delegates and committees. The first one from page 43. It's item RC 13 slash 18, report of committees and delegates. Israel's Public Libraries Association, 17th of May 2018. Councillor McNish, bring the author. You happy to move that way? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Second, please. Councillor White, Petrie, and I thank you. Councillor McNish, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Interesting, after much of the meeting was spent on the call or the need for more funding that we had the rug pulled out and was totally in the state budget. If you read my figures there, um, I, um, <coughs> the council does provide 93% of the library funding anyway. This is the lowest of all the Australian states. <coughs> Probably a good time. Um, for a campaign, especially with this state election coming out next <coughs> March, uh, they tried the government tried this back in 2005 or six. I just can't remember what year it was. Council <coughs> resolved then to send Robin Riley, the local manager, himself to Sydney for a protest. We actually had a big meeting at the state library that we stood outside the Hunter House with a little placard. The old campaign, you. The old campaign. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I'm a bit embarrassed by the old thing. Actually, some funding was restored. Did you have all the other? Some funding was restored, so it did have, you know, did yeah. have an impact on doing that. Um, uh, I think most, most of my report is self-explanatory. I tried to make it as interesting as I could. There's a lot of technical stuff I didn't bother putting in here because I know you wouldn't read it anyway. But there was a bit of a call there for more councillors to go to the state conference. And of course, the idea is then, of course, the councillors, more councillors can find out how the library works and all that sort of thing. They might push harder for more funding. It all comes back to funding. And the conference this year is in um, Coffs Harbour. It's in November sometime. I'm just not sure of the actual dates. But it would be good if one or two councillors, extra councillors, could come down. If council approves it, I would be going with the um, I'd be manager. You could have had a couple of other things as. 
Anyway, we got the Sarah. Uh, that, thanks for that comment of Sarah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's about all. Any, any questions about the report or questions to Councillor McNish? Is the uh, Councillor Murray? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I commend Councillor McNish on his report. I think it was very interesting. I read it twice. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and the reason for that is this moving over to community hubs is occurring and has been occurring now for about three to four years. And it's very interesting, and I'm wondering what we will do about changing our library over to a community hub, which is the way we're going to go, obviously. Uh, a very interesting. Thank you. Well, it's, it's actually happening there, Councillor Murray. If you go over there, the family history groups and different groups like that do meet in the library. The trove is incredibly popular. Yeah. You know, people are doing family trees and that sort of thing. Yeah, I would like to be the library really, because it's 1999, apart from my little four years of article, but uh, we used to go to conferences, we used to uh, have one day of the conference where the librarians would talk about the books and cataloging and all that sort of stuff, whereas electric councillors would hop on the bus and we generally go to other libraries and see how they operated. The one of the things that stirred my mind of all the libraries I went to was the amount of people in them, what they were doing. They were really vibrant, alive places. Even people playing chess, groups talking, music, all the computers, of course, were going, and, uh, and if, you know, funding is cut, a lot of those services are taken out, it's going to have a big impact on the community. So I'd like, and I'm sure Tim the Council will support any action taken by the uh, library executive to try and get this decision overturned. Any other questions to our, to, uh, our councillor to, to do the report? Councillor, I do thank you for the report, and, and you mentioned your volunteering that you've been involved, but we like to have the councillor with to do this, and you've been very good with the, as, a, as a delegate to the library. Very generous task. Uh, to support the you know, title of your report with the conference in, in Coffs Harbour, that, um, that's something I can see that the council you know, could send some extra to because of the loaded location, obviously. Um, you know, whether we're there for one or two days, but I said that's something else to do. It won't be that much cost, but I think we should support it. But just a note to council that the, the library, like the Swirl Bill, like the our museum, is something that, that that we provide to the community. Um, we can't keep doing it, you know, for every day without the support from the government. So uh, that's the that's the argument that's been built on, and, and uh, right across the board, no one shifts away from that to be supportive of the local government in New South Wales in their campaign for the uh, budget to be reviewed. The report said, "Find him, find him, council. All happy to receive a note against carry on." <coughs> Councillors move to page 45 in your hard copy, so item RC 14 slash 18. It's uh, the report to do with the um, hearing on group council meeting by myself, and uh, I'm happy to move that way. Can I have a second, please? Councillor Murray, I thank you. Councillor, and the CE was, was in attendance at this meeting, so both of us happy to take any questions to do the report. Councillor Brom. Thanks, this one about the um, resolution 5.6. Um, that's the uh, one to do with the renewable energy workshops, and um, Terry is nominated yes. to, to be in charge of someone from Arndell Nurella. And then the next one was the waste to energy. So yeah. the first one, the renewable energy, you're looking at not just waste to energy, you're looking at all sorts of things there, are you, Terry? Uh, <coughs> uh, yes, that's correct, uh, Councillor. The first one is about. Um, um, coming up with a blueprint of the process all local governments um, would have to go through to enter into a public-private partnership with a pre-approved uh, energy provider, and there's five that have been pre-approved by local government procurement, or through local government procurement. Um, and additionally, to how to enter into a community agreement, because uh, Essential Energy and Energy Australia and Snowy, Red, Pacific Hydro and a few others uh, don't deal directly uh, with councils or the public or anyone else wanting to hook up a microgrid. They deal through, again, um, a small number of pre-approved community agreement providers or PPAs. I don't know if you what the PPA means, but they're community uh, agreement people. And this uh, workshop 
is to determine uh, in the DP DPC's words the blueprint for councils to go um, uh, through the process of connecting a microgrid uh, through a public-private partnership and the microgrid could be wind, it could be water, it could be solar, it could be waste, it could be anything. Uh, up until I attended the meeting at Armadale in February of this year, waste or energy wasn't mentioned, but I noticed in the, um, uh, the agenda that was sent out by um, uh, the DPC that waste or energy uh, is definitely going to be included in the um, investigation of blueprint, uh, but that shouldn't be confused with um, uh, 5.7 waste to energy because although about one sixth of the projects have got something in common, uh, they're large, largely uh, different. Any other questions, councillors? Just a couple of things I will make that, that uh, keep everybody up to speed because obviously this was the last meeting of the uh, of our rock, now our JO. Uh, the Narrabri were invited on page 52 to uh, present their case to, to the board. They did. They have been accepted on the, to the JO and the other one and uh, fully support to do with the resolution on page 54 um, from the uh, from that rock to the waste energy. And uh, that's, that's, um, that has continued on to the J.A. And, uh, and I, I thank very much the work that our CA has put into this and the support that, uh, that has been gained everywhere we go. So it's just a step by step. Council, with the reports there, we'll have you to receive a note. Against? Okay, thank you. Council, page 57. It's the uh, report, it's RC, Duke Glen Slash 18. The report to do with the country, New South Wales Country Mayors Association. Once again, I'm the author. I just provided a short with the, uh, and then to do with a couple of reports. Um, I'm happy to move that, and if I can have a second, please. Councillor Harry, I thank you. Have you taken any questions, councillors? No questions? Reports there? Happy to receive a note. Against? Carry. Thank you. <coughs> Page 58 and Hart Cobby Councillors, RC 1618. Boards of Committees and Delegates, Parks and Gardens, Open Space Committee. Councillor Story, been the author, you haven't moved that way. I think we need an adjustment on my title, there. Eh? On your title? Yes, <laughs> Councillor, Deputy <laughs> Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. Okay. Well, well with, with, that, with that correction, are you happy to move? Problem in, yeah. Right. Okay, um, Sorry, go on, a second, please. Councillor Mike Peter, thank you. Councillor Sawyer, uh, being the chair of the meeting, thank you for stepping in doing that, wonderful job. Um, did, did, did you want to speak to the meeting? I think the minutes are self-explanatory and the number of pages typifies the involvement of the impediments of the people that are actually members of that advisory committee and it's a well worthwhile committee, isn't it? No, I think. Yeah, I think. <laughs> and and I, I did attend there out of interest and, and asked what I was doing there, but, um, I was there because I wanted to be there and, and, and just see how everything was going, and it, it is going to be. I do commend you and that, uh, and that committee, the councillor and, and everybody involved and the, and the, the, the locals too. Uh, one thing I do want to note that the uh, support that, that's received uh, to do with the uh, ferry lights in Mouth Street, that is a long-term plan of this council, that's what we need to do. I can share with you that it's been to the roads and traffic and, uh, and it's supported there too. And no problems from our RMS side. Uh, as we go along and with finances, um, um, I can see that happening. So. Any other questions to Councillor Murray? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I was going to ask about, I was a little surprised that um, RMS would approve that. It seems it, to. Well, I can the share. The effect of those lights, yeah. which I, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a, a traffic disruption. It's, it's actually been to, been to been discussed with RMS some time ago, and we were reminded about that the other day. They can't see uh, they can't see any problems with that. They're not that they're a flashing neon thing or anything like that. Actually, and it's only my opinion, it might even improve the lighting at a couple of points ever crossings. That's just personal view. Well, I would argue, of course, that we only look high level. We don't look. Up much yeah. until we see lights yeah. and they drag us in. But anyway, the RMS has approved it, that's fine. Now, the other thing I was thinking was heritage do they have an input into this or do they want to 
do with the street light? Well, yes, because it's not really in keeping with the heritage yeah. precinct. Fair question, Councillor. I didn't think that way about even um, mentioning it at the heritage meeting. I don't know if you think Councillor Robin, but whether it sits there, but I can't see how heritage would disapprove that, then that, that, that's going to come back to well, Council for ratification. Because, and I'm not being a rather No, 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 you're fine. This changes it over to a tinsel path. Um, you put the lights up. Heritage is on a different path than completely. And this is what we've got. This is all we've got. And the heritage town is really the big one. That's the one that's the Anyway, I, I feel that it, it, it's where it was discussed here needed to be discussed, and it was discussed at length, um, the presentation. Uh, then, what might have been the next day, Councillor, I think, I come and said, or well, that week, whatever it was. But anyway, but it's going to Roads and Traffic, and Roads and Traffic Committee are, are supporting the Kennedy kind of problem. And uh, I think it adds to the uniqueness of this town. And, and um, as to our streetscape, and as to the, the the upcoming bypass to get drawing people in, and yeah, anyway, we'll get there. So we will. Can you yes, of course. Sorry, uh, Mr. Berry. Yeah, I was down at um, the rocks recently, and it was the night before I was to start. Yep. I walked back up and I had to leave because I missed it again. But I did notice that they had. Um, their trees and it's a permanent fixture of lights and they're not the bright happy ones out here, the tinsel ones. They're actually coloured and they change colour okay. from blue to soft pinks to whatever and they they gradually change and it was so effective. The other thing they did up George Street as you leave the rocks, a lot of their old old buildings and you know that's a very old area. Um, they were lit up and I don't know if it was in preparation for fire or not, because it's permanent. But above the awnings and shining onto the face of the building, they didn't. So each building had a different colour, like it was a, a watermelon colour and a different and blue, and it, and it just looked gorgeous. Because you could actually see, uh, certainly the bright street light, you could see this lovely soft colour actually highlighting, and I thought that would look fantastic just along this section of. Of Rouse Street. So I'm just if we ever go, if we're looking at other trees, yes. um, maybe it is not the bright ones of the main street, which might even be something quite sleek. Maybe you could actually get a coloured light. Um, that one, come in, look at the photo, but it's really, really nice. Yeah, no, they do look good. But anyway, as I said, thank you, Carl, we'll get there. Oh, so, I'll just cancel it, respect, I'll go to Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Just to add to what Councillor Peggy just said, when Councillor Greg first moved this nation, I did look at a lot of the overseas stuff and some very famous places in France and Europe have actually got coloured lights on what you call, I don't know what it is, new stuff, it's not heritage. Over there you're talking about centuries old and they've got uh, trees, they've got various forms of light and all these heritage Mr. Councillor Murray, I apologise you did have more. To, to do the report, Councillor? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to i just come back from Sydney a little while ago, and I was out in the harbour looking at the lights, and that is something to behold, yeah. what they can do with the light. Yeah. I mean, the transformation is just something. The other thing I wanted to mention was a floodlight to feature this tree out here in the park. Yeah. Not like coming from the bottom, just right line like the tree. Yep. Which is out ahead of the Well, once again, Councillor, to help you, that, that needs to go back to from this committee. Yep. And, and after, and because because stay there on Saturday night, you you have had the great job staying in that hotel at Maureen, that that flood of gum in that creek where that restaurant is now. Yes. How good does that look? Absolutely. Mobile old flood of gum looks absolutely fantastic with the flood light at the bottom. <laughs> Almost want to take it home. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't the same in that same I just need to think of pair, that's all. Gas yes, McNeese, I apologise. I think man, I just remember from when I was in Sydney, I think the first night of the people. It was our home. <laughs> no, no, Sydney. 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 Yeah. It was a, it was uh, it was beautiful to see. Yeah. I, I think at the time that maybe you know tend to be a good look at something in the future on a much, much, much smaller scale, but it's amazing what they can do with lights these days, and uh, 
Uh, just one other question, Mr. Terry. Can we have a game with our horticulturalist stroke, kid gardener stroke, whatever person? Um, um, I don't know whether we've had interviews or we've just arranged interviews, yeah. but we've got a lot of applications. And um, when I was speaking last to uh, the acting HR and workforce development manager who spoke this morning, um, we've got some of the, the best qualified, best experienced applicants you can imagine. Uh, to, to, I can't say where they're from because it's obviously when someone's got a job is confidential. But the highest caliber uh, applications um, you could possibly wish for. That's great news. Yes. And, that, and that just on quickly, that with Barry's presentation this morning, he did alert to that, uh, with the quality of all applications that we're getting for some of those positions. No, he didn't. He never knew us. No, he wasn't. No, of course not. Okay, Councillor, do you want another question, Councillor? Oh, I'll answer your question. I did want to do it now. I'll answer your question. I was answering your question to me. What was my question again, Councillor? Is it about heritage? Oh, okay. Councillor Wall, you have the question, okay. I'm having trouble. Um, Food? Oh, I'll allow to. You actually can't limit me, but anyway. I can. Councillor <laughs> Murray, I was wondering what the idea spreadsheet was, and then I'd set some for Councillor Victoria. Sorry? What about the spreadsheet? The spreadsheet oh, of five ideas. I didn't read the report, so forgive me. I thought oh. you read it twice. <laughs> I said spreadsheet. Or was that Councillor Mendes' report? Spreadsheet from ideas are to be put in spreadsheet from Council and Murray to send out to meetings. Yes. I was just wondering what the spreadsheet from ideas. I'll just, I'll just call you and I'll be here as a good start. There was a discussion at that particular meeting yes, about the evaluation of the um, spreadsheet for the Strong Country Communities Grant Fund um, about sending those out. And um, so, in our industry capacity, we've sent those out to the Parks and Gardens Committee to remind them of Council's decision to priorities for that particular. Oh, I thought it might, I thought it might be new ideas for coming okay. something. Yeah, two chances to yeah. I was wondering, um, the interpretive panels, um, I believe Ken Halliday might have done the previous ones. I know we were about doing interpretive panels in Grosvenor Park, etc. Yeah. Uh, and if there's any others, how do we go about allocating who who prepares the material for the panel to search to make sure everything's Yeah, correct. that's a big question. Um, and then I'll oh, I can only imagine what the, you're talking about who researches and gets it right. And yeah. I, I would argue that, um, that without much respect to Ken, I don't think he had all that much to do with the, with the panels because he's, he's pointed out some misspellings and oh, wrong okay. truths on several times to me. So I like the one suck that counselor and so you might be able to give some advice. I would say everything, but Okay, well whoever does it for yeah. me. Yeah, I was just trying to get food 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 and yeah. we get a, a say on so yeah. there are many mistakes yeah. 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 Well, well, you Councillor Murray, I'll go to you and I'll and I'll start to come in with some advice. Councillor Murray through you must have the territory pounds were done by the street service yes. committee. That's where we start. And I don't know who actually did the actual research. research. Yeah. Oh, did you have some guidance there or help? Or? Yeah, so, um, my understanding from those is that council staff will actually put together the draft of those interpretive <coughs> panels with um, the same um, style of guidance. I guess that's what we've got existing, and they would then be passed on both to the Heritage Committee and the Parks and Gardens Committee for comment prior to us actually you know, making any moves around the council. And I, uh, before you go, Councillor, just on this topic, because you're referring to books apart, uh, we have got, because I know when we, we were doing the um, research of books apart in the previous council, uh, there was plenty of research went into it, and what used to come out to do with books as wife. I just can't think of the name, and please forgive me for that. Um, and her involvement as a gardener, and yeah, but anyway, but it was, there, is his, there is information here. Yeah, but that helps. Uh, and I'll add to that, it was John Mungard.
trees that are actually within some of the parks. Yep. So I was wondering if we could collate the information we have got and have a, a map of the, the, the streets in Chenefield with the different plantings that are on the different blocks, but also have a um, eventually get a, a map of the each park and, yep. and, and still in out what the tree has to be done. They're mostly really easily identified. Yep. Um, that might and we can promote that, especially when people are doing their spring and autumn, um, spring and autumn quizzes. And then I'm just wondering what, what the labyrinth is. What's the labyrinth? Action number ten. Labyrinth to be installed in Kennefield. No, it's the um, oh, control. It's um, what we've got one on top of the hill here. Cat. No, a labyrinth is not a maze. The dictionary says it's a, it's a pattern on the ground that does not necessarily have any height. It can be rolled up and whatever. It's under investigation, not to install it. It will take a lot of discussion. Uh, the original question, Councillor Petrie, about the item six, in addition to what Kyle has said, those particular maps are going to be collated and available for tourists to pick up at the Tourist Information Centre. Each of the parks, depending on budget, will have an interpretive panel at each park saying that tree just over there is this, that and the other. So that, that was the exact subject of the discussion under item 6. And, and to support what you're hoping there, uh, Councillor Sawyer, if you remember to do with the number 3 of the Shakespeare Garden, that was cut and decision made by the, uh, with respect by the um, uh, Parks and Gardens uh, Committee, the Open Space Committee, um, rather than do that with the Shakespeare to move towards actually identifying uh, every tree and every plant in Millbrook Park, and especially with the density, which I wasn't aware of, is the shape of Southern Cross. And, and that's what the public side of the number. We have. Anyway. Okay, councillors. Any more questions to, to uh, the chair of that meeting as Councillor Sawyer was? No? Reports there, Councillors, all having received a note. Again, Karen. Councillors, that's the end of our reports from committees. There's no notices of motions, Councillors. Resolution registered to our R65. It's uh, RES5 slash 18. Council resolution registered June 2018. Can I move a second to you, please? Councillor Irving, I thank you. Second of Councillor Mike Petrie, I thank you. And I'll hand over to our CE to uh, present this report. Um, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have questions from Councillor by exception. Councillors, any questions to our CE to do the report? Councillor Sawyer. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CE. Um, I note that the offer to purchase that block in the industrial estate has been withdrawn. Um, has the purchase of the other block that is actually occupying been finalised through? And I think, Mr. Mayor, I understand why the offer was withdrawn. I didn't ask uh, Mr. Bolton uh, for the details. I'll take on notice and find out and uh, it'll be um, okay by council and inform you all by email. Yeah, questions to the CD, Councillor McKitchin, we indicate. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm through you to Terry. Um, just on the uh, report of delegates to the local shire traffic community meeting, there was an item there about the parking outside the saddle shop and the uh, action was going to be to ask him to remove the witches hat. But that was there Saturday and Sunday. So we say again. The witches hats were out again on Saturday and Sunday. I just wanted to the action's been taken. In, in, in a meeting with uh, Chess from the you know, Transport Department or Traffic Department, as recently as Monday, he hadn't received the correspondence yet to notify him that that, that decision was made and to be supportive of the committee and, and, and the client. We all know the history of that and, and, and uh, that wonderful building, but no business has rights to put which this has in front of And if we did make a ruling, that then uh, it doesn't stop anybody from seeing him in filing or, or kitchen garden and doing the same thing. That was our argument. Um, it is a bit ongoing, Councillor Mitchell, if I can check, because in another motion it was another uh, point of business to do with that committee, not all over the place, I'm trying to make this work, but it later come that uh, there's concerns to do with, with parking long term in front of the local services office. 
So the committee, through our staff, are looking at it. I'm not going to come in any time. I'm looking at where the high street, I'm not aware whether it's got a limited parking there. Two hours. Two hours. So there is in high street? Yeah. Yes. Because no one seemed to be really aware of the meeting. It's too sad, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're even going to, even if we looked at that, to try and can't please everyone, just to sat for an instance, you know, that, that, that was, you know, well, I don't know, some sort of limited parking there, so they had to move the car, was going to be there all day, or two hours, or whatever, I don't know. Sorry. Just finish with Councillor Yeah, that's definitely two hours, because uh, Councillor Bridges, I had a question, we have been asked about a number of business advisory, and we can check that it's two hours. Okay, two hours. Now, why is it taking so long for council to write a letter to the proprietor that those minutes were ratified at the last council meeting, which is a month ago? I mean, how come you haven't still received the letter by now? No, no they won't, council. Because the, the, the minutes we're talking about now aren't in this business plan. Well, it was only last, last week. Yeah, last week. Well, this is a resolution. Register. Well, it came from the. the this, what well, I just said to you, that came out of the last roads and traffic committee meeting last week. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we, we ratified the minutes of the roads and traffic committee at the last council meeting. Council yeah. 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 Which would have been the 20th of January. Yeah. 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 Yeah
and you know, you're right up near the top. People go about from those trees there and you can really over the top and you want something on the road to let them know that they're crossing there. Have you got any comment, Oliver? Yeah, 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 Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Look, uh, I think we, we can certainly check that out, but I think we find that it's, it's very much dictated by the, the sort of risk that the risk assessment that's done on these uh, issues. Uh, you, you'll notice when you come to, um, I've seen what you're talking about in places, but then that's been in very highly traffic areas and high speeds, well, a lot, lot more than 40 cars now, right? You, you go on um, this kind of thing down in parks. We, it's not, not actually a, a, a pedestrian crossing to cover with, with railway tracks because the railway line crosses near the park. You will see the sort of thing that you, you know, you're talking about sort of leading up to something that's a potential hazard. Um, I have seen them, but sort of the reason for them, I'm not 100% sure. I've got a feeling that it's probably related to the risk. We can check it out. We've got some trials there coming up there. No, not something we want to try back I'm going to run out of something out of the way. It's just got a little round sign there that says the crossing. There's nothing there, so we'll have to search it. Did you take any notice of what they've got down here? No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. What about the other hand? I saw it. I saw it. Order, please. Gareth. There's a little bit of confusion here. I don't think Michael was talking about having that zigzag leading up to the crossing. The fact is, it's just two pedestrian signs there, but there's no zebra crossing on, as opposed to in, yeah. this, in this block and outside of the Pilgrims, there's actually nothing on the, on the, on the tar. Yeah. That's what this, is that? Yeah. 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 yeah, there's lines, you're saying there's no lines on the bitumen? Oh, there's no cross lines, but before you get to the cross, oh, okay. indicating no, that it's going up. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. to move forward, Councillor, I, I think it's appropriate yeah. Andre's already, already said they're looking, but it's probably something will raise for RMS. We reckon it's here, they're on the next range of traffic. If you're happy with that, Councillor Mike, we'll bring it up at our next range of traffic as, a, as an item yeah, for advice from the RMS, because just remember the RMS control that. So I'm going to duck on the neck. We thought we had. Yeah. We'll raise it again, as we do. Okay, Councillors, any more questions? Uh, to a to do with the uh, council resolution, Commissioner. No more. All happy to receive a note to the status report. All in favour? Cancel carry. Councillors, there's no confidential business. That brings us to the end of our June meeting. I thank you all very much for your spirited bidding and attendance. And I wish you all. The meeting is ended. Peace and Thank you.